is found floating in an idyllic Tennessee river, questions abound. You started thinking, is it someone who's fishing maybe fell, hurt themselves? We had no idea who this was. Is this a tragic accident or a deadly cover-up? He had some blood around his mouth and his nose, and there was blood on the side of his head. A nearby fire suggests someone went to great lengths to cover their tracks. The car had already been engulfed in flames and, and consumed by fire. Nothing left of it. What was going through our minds was, are these two crimes related? As the pieces fall into place, a tale of he said, she said threatens to derail the investigation. I was here, dude. You know what I mean? No one could ever imagine the twisted path that would lead detectives to a killer. This was very intentional, and they wanted to die. They said, if you don't help me, you're next. February 2nd, 2011, Sequatchie County, Tennessee. It's just after 8 a.m. in this rural community outside of Chattanooga as Detective Jody Lockhart settles in for the day. We're sitting around talking. We're trying to get a game plan what we're going to do for the day. And then we get a call. Sequatchie County 911, what's the problem? Well, ma'am, I'm walking to the and I think I've seen a body folks. I'm not for sure, but I mean, I just said I'm running. Detective Lockhart immediately rushes to the riverfront, nine miles away from the sheriff's office. At that point, we don't know how he got there or why he was there. We started thinking, is it someone who's fishing maybe fell, hurt themselves, somebody who maybe got drunk and fell? The scene itself looked like people would go there and drink. There were beer cans and debris at the scene. Biggest Bridge is the area that we were called to. It's on the south end of our county. A lot of kids and adults like to party down there just because it's out of the way. It's in a rural spot. When detectives reach the river's edge, they're met with a disturbing sight. You have to walk down. It's a muddy, slippery trip. We start walking down into there, um, and you get down to where you start seeing the crest of the water, and, you, and at that point in time, you can see the body. The body was not a small guy. He was a larger male. We go ahead and we, we back off. We rope the scene off to make sure no one else can get in. We're trying to figure out who the body is. How did he get here? We're just running anything you can think of through your head. You have a body in the water. Is it a suicide? Is it an accident? Or is it a homicide? Detectives decide they need all hands on deck and call in for help from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. I remember receiving a call from uh, Detective Lockhart who advised that they discovered a body in the river under Pickett's Bridge. I immediately responded to the area. When I arrived at the scene, uh, they had the end of the road blocked off uh, with crime scene tape. Uh, several Sheriff's Department vehicles were already present on the scene. Officers wade into the cold, wintry water and pull the body to shore. We go into the water. It's probably about waist-deep water. As I first started walking up, I noticed it's a white male who's wearing blue jeans, an orange shirt, and had some suspenders on. He was face up. He had one hand of the water, and his boots were out of the water. I've seen bodies in water that have been in much worse shape. I think what helped in this instance was the water was cold, and I think that helped preserve the body. bring the body to shore, detectives and medical examiners begin a more thorough inspection. Sometimes the officers in the community, they're familiar with a lot of the local folks. They uh, can identify who they are immediately once we arrive on the scene. But this wasn't the case in this investigation. We had no idea who this gentleman was. He looked like your typical white male that had been in the river for a good 12 hours. He was the gray color that you normally see. Your body changes. You lose all pigment of your skin when the blood pulls away from you. You get a, like an ashy gray color. He had blood on the side of his head. There was some blood around his mouth or nose, but we didn't know if he'd been struck with an object. There were no other visible wounds to him. The remains are placed in a body bag, and he's transported to Nashville for an autopsy. While they await 
wait to the results of the autopsy, detectives searched the surrounding area, hoping for clues to the victim's identity. We found blood between the tree line and the mud. We collected the tire impressions where a car would look like it had parked at where the blood would have been at. Investigators also discovered two sets of footprints and a trail leading to the river's edge. We found what appeared to be like a heel of a boot being drugged all the way down. It was just a solid straight line that would skip every now and then as if you were dragging something heavy all the way there to the water. You know that this guy didn't drag himself and put himself in the water. Drag marks would eliminate a suicide. We also felt it would eliminate an accidental death. So it did appear fairly quickly that this was um, the result of foul play of some sort. There's just speculation as to what might have happened. One of the things we talked about was there a fight at the scene, you know, were people out there drinking or doing something and a fight ensued and the victim was killed. You're trying to keep your mind open to any possibility as to what it might be. After processing the scene, detectives turned to the 911 caller, Larry Eggert. You have times when the 911 caller is actually the perpetrator, so we have to rule out everyone from being a suspect in this case. Egger tells detectives he was in the area hoping to make a little money. Mr. Egger was aware that people would go down there and party, and um, they usually don't clean up their beer cans. He would collect aluminum cans to take the recycling center, and they would pay him. As police continue questioning Eggert, he remains cooperative. That is, until police ask him to show them where he first spotted the body. He didn't want to go back nowhere near the river at all. Of course, we didn't make him. We kept him away. He just described everything he saw, and he was visibly shaken up. You could tell that seeing the body bothered him. To determine if he is involved in the crime, detectives compare Eggert's shoes to the footprints discovered near the river's edge. We took foot impressions from him at the scene, and he was ruled out as a potential suspect. There was no indication that Mr. Ager was anything other than the fellow who found the body. After we got through work at the crime scene, we go back to our office to try to strategize and think about how we can identify who he is. Uh, we won't alert the, uh, the news media. As detectives discuss their next move, they receive more troubling news. We had a deputy who came down the hall and mentioned that there was a fire scene that he had worked involving a vehicle. We thought that it was kind of odd that we had a car burning at the same time. There's a body in the river. Coming up, out of the ashes comes a crucial clue that will kick this investigation into high gear. The owner of the residence that was closed heard the explosions. By the grace of God, he had recovered a handicap placard from that scene started noticing he looked a lot like the gentleman that we found in the river. Detectives in Sequatchie County, Tennessee are learning the details of a mysterious fire that seems to have occurred just hours before they fished an unknown man out of the river. This occurred on the north end of our county, kind of a remote area where the car was at. Very secluded, not many people around. The owner of the residence that was close heard the explosions. He called the dispatch center, dispatch center, an officer out there. By the time officers arrived to the scene, the vehicle was a total loss. The car had already been pretty much in, engulfed in flames and, and consumed by fire. Not nothing left of it. Couldn't tell what it was. We had a vehicle that had been torched, and then we have a body in the river on the same day. It is not atypical for criminals to burn a car in, a, in an effort to conceal evidence. What was going through our minds was, are these two crimes related? While the car was completely destroyed in the fire, officers were able to salvage one key piece of evidence. By the grace of God, it recovered a handicap placard from that scene. He found the handicap tag that was partially burnt, and he brought it back to the office so we could maybe investigate that crime. We took the handicap tag, we ran the numbers through the DMV. The tag is registered to a 1996 Monte Carlo owned by an area resident. It led us to the name of Clifford Carden. At that time, we didn't know who Clifford Carden was or who our body was. 
we went ahead and pulled up a driver's license picture of him, started noticing he looked a lot like the gentleman that we found in the river. From an early age, Clifford M. Cardin Jr. loved two things, family and cars. My father was a mechanic for 30 plus years of his life, um, and he was into cars. That was a big NASCAR guy. That's what he loved. You couldn't drag him away if you had to. It was crazy of all of the memorabilia that he had collected of Dale Earnhardt and Dale Earnhardt Jr. Knives, watches, cards. If it had Dale Earnhardt on it, my father had purchased it. Besides cars and racing, Cliff's other passion in life was his family. Even though his first marriage ended in divorce, the doting father still remained actively involved with his children, Chris and Sendora. When they divorced, he just moved right across the street. So coming home from school, he would be there. If, if I had a ball game that day, everybody went. That's just the way my childhood was with my dad and my mom. Then in 1988, at age 32, Cliff decided to give love another shot when he met 27-year-old Cindy Tapley. We got married on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1991. I fell in love with him because he was so kind and so gentle. He was just an awesome person. When my dad and Cindy were together, he took care of her to the best of his ability. He would provide and do what he had to, to provide. I already had two children and he played with my kids. I mean, it was just like whatever was in my house that belonged to me, he accepted it right away. He was just my big teddy bear. <laughs> Though he'd always enjoyed life, by the time Cliff was 50, issues with his weight had begun to have a detrimental impact on his day-to-day -day activities. My dad, he's right at 350, 375 pounds. He needed to lose weight. My father struggled with diabetes. He was a heart patient, um, neuropathy of the hands and feet. His health issues were really bad. That's where my stepmom, Cindy, had stepped in to help take care of him. But Cliff's health wasn't the only thing in his life going downhill. After nearly two decades of marriage, he and Cindy separated, leaving Cliff to live alone in his trailer. He was not coming home until like two to three o'clock in the morning. My son and his wife came with a U-Haul and made two loads and I moved. And I just took what was mine. Dad hated being single. He, he, he needed a companion. My father's trailer looked like somebody had taken a 16 by 80 trailer and dropped it right in the middle of a tomato field. His nearest neighbor was uh, a mile and a half down the road and daddy was afraid to be alone. So he would drive off the mountain every day to find something to do, to keep himself busy. But on February 3rd, 2011, it seems Cliff had gone out and never returned. Right before Christmas, we started talking again. We were discussing me coming back home. He said, I want us to work. But I kept trying to call him and there was no answer. My stepmother could not get in touch with my father on the phone. She had called and left message after message and got the feeling something was wrong. So she calls me and wants to know if I had heard from my father. Sandy, I said, your daddy's not home and it's not like him to leave our gizmo, which is our dog, outside. A chill runs down Sandora's spine as she tells her stepmother she has not spoken to her father in days. We usually talked about at least three or four times a week, but I had not heard from him. I hung up with her and started calling around the places where I knew he was at or people he might have been with and could not reach my father. 24 long hours pass with no word from Cliff. There was so much going through my head at that point in time of what had happened. It was just such an uneasy feeling because it's not like him not to communicate. I went through every hospital in the parking lot to see if I could see his little red car because he'd had a heart attack before. So I thought, well, maybe he's at the hospital. Then Cindy gets a call that changes everything. I get a phone call from the TBI. He says, does your husband have any, any identification marks on his body? And I said, yeah, he's got tattoos on his 
his arm and I described the tattoos and he goes, we found your husband. I said, is he okay? And he said, he was dead. It was like my heart was broke. And then all of a sudden I got numb, you know? Got a phone call and I don't even remember who it was that called me. I set the phone down, I turned to my wife, Marlene, and said, um, Dad's dead. They found him. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to his house. First, I didn't believe it, but then I had talked to my brother on the phone, and he was on his way to come get me. We were going to go find out. comes forward with key information about a suspect. He had a lady with him. I've never seen her before. Was she like? Was she older or younger? Five, three, five, four, had straight thick black hair. A little bit shorter than mine. They had some mud on their shoes and that they were in a fast pace to get away from that area. River. Police are now trying to figure out what happened to 55-year-old Cliff Carden. We were still waiting back to hear from the medical examiners on the autopsy to find out the cause of death. To find out more, detectives initiate a search of Cliff's residence. As they begin to work, Cliff's son Chris arrives at the home and immediately notices something out of place. Dale Hart, 118 scale porcelain car. It was one of Dad's prize possession to, as far as his collection goes and I noticed immediately that it was missing other valuable items from Cliff's memorabilia collection are also missing there was no signs of forced entry but uh, there had been items removed you could tell the house was disarrayed there was stuff on the floor someone had went through it like they were looking for something to detectives the condition of the home suggests Cliff was robbed by someone he knew but as police continue to search the home, they make a sinister discovery. There was a gas propane tank laid against the furnace heater area. In my opinion, that was set to try to burn the house down after someone had went through and tried to steal what they needed out of the house. While police still don't know who is responsible for Cliff's death, others are beginning to have their suspicions. Given how people were acting, what had taken place, I immediately thought, Cindy's involved in this. She has to be. Clifford Carton's estranged wife, Cindy Carton, did not live at the house with Cliff. They'd been separated for approximately 11 months. Though Chris doesn't have any proof their stepmother is involved in their father's death, police take his concerns seriously. I do remember being asked, do you think your stepmom has something to do with this? They were looking at her. But, of course, they said the partner would be the first one they look at. It made me feel like she had something to do with it, that it was her. At this point in time, you know, we had ruled everybody out as being a potential suspect in this case. You look at family members, the estranged wife, everybody's a suspect. As detectives finish up with Cliff's children, Cindy arrives on the scene. The police called and told me to come up to the house. So I went to the home, and they were investigating the scene. We interviewed Mr. Carden's wife, Simi, and she was very helpful to us. She cooperated with every bit of the investigation we had. She said they've not been together for a while. She was visibly upset. I was the last one that had verbally talked to him. I was in college to get my bachelor's degree, and I had a, a problem with a paper that I wanted him to kind of help me understand. I kept trying to call him every 30 minutes. Cindy Carden told the officers where she was during the applicable time frame, and they were able to verify. Starts, you know, trying to fight back. Susan reaches out to see, displays a gun and shoots him. But my head is that quick. Bettis tells detectives that he had no idea Susan intended to shoot Cliff. And after pulling the trigger, she turned the gun on him next. After she shot him, I think she looked at me and I was scared, dude. You know what I mean? I just wasn't thinking she shot the f***ing head that far from me. She said, if you don't help me, you're next. 
and Brian Bettis' explanation to law enforcement was that he was scared and had to go along with this because she threatened him. We had the gun. There is a rough tire. She could pull up. She told me this quick. She did him. We just went down the road. From there, Baker and Bettis moved the body out from the driver's side and drove to Pickett's Bridge where Baker and Bettis pulled Mr. Carden out of the car, pulled him into the river, and left him there. Then they dropped the car out to Cliff Carden's house and they steal from his house. Finally, the two shacked up in the Mountain Inn and Suites for the night. Y'all go back to the motel room and have a fling in the sack? Yeah. It made her horny. It was disturbing. Detectives have to consider the possibility that Brian is lying to them. You'll hear that from folks. They'll blame it on the other person. We were just waiting to hear her side of the story. Coming up, Susan Baker has her own story to tell. You shot him. Who shot him? Um, First time I've ever anyone react the, uh, the, the murder scene to me. It was a hard situation. You don't really believe it at first. Following his interview with Tennessee authorities on February 8th, 2011, 34-year-old Brian Bettis is arrested for the murder of 55-year-old Cliff Carden. However, Bettis maintains that his girlfriend, 35-year-old Susan Baker, is the real person responsible for the murder. During the interview, Brian Bettis uh, advises that uh, Susan has a friend that she may be at in Chattanooga. Around 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, we hooked up with Saudi Daisy officers and Hamilton County officers and went to the residence. She did not uh, resist in, in any way. She seemed like she was just in the house, just you know, hanging out, waiting on the police to come get her. Detectives place Susan under arrest and escort her back to the Sequatchie County Justice Center for questioning. Tell us when you met Cliff. Susan Baker said Clifford Carden was the first man to have been good to her, took her to Gatlinburg, took her to Daytona. According to Susan, Cliff also provided something else for her, easy access to pills. Like Brian's account, Susan says on the day of the murder, the plan was simply to rob Cliff, not hurt him. That day, I said, basically robbed the robbers bill and get his money and be done with it. Never hurry, never do that for one time. But one vital detail of her account is significantly different from Brian's. Cliff started being real smart ass. He he ran hard and he told me he was going to kill me. And Brian was sitting right there when he heard him. What? Shot. You shot him? Who shot him? Um, Susan Baker told the officers that Brian Bettis was the shooter. As detectives recount Brian's statement, Susan does an about face. I snapped. I did. I snapped. I didn't look at him when I done it. I didn't even know if he came or not. So you're no glass break or nothing. Susan offers to reenact the, uh, the shooting. She asked me to pull my seat up next to her as if I was driving. Yeah, you grabbed your arm. I grabbed my arm and I just went like this and I like that. In the interview, I'm kind of taken back by it. It's the first time I've ever had anyone react to the, uh, the murder scene to me. In addition to her startling confession, Susan also admits to disposing of Cliff's body, robbing his house, and burning his car. We charged Baker and Bettis with felony murder because they killed him in the perpetration of a robbery. 
and they were charged with destruction of personal property for burning the car. My sister was the one that called me and told me. Um, she called and told me, she said, hey, they, they, they got Susan. I said, great. When I did find out it was my mom, this was a hard situation. Like, you don't really believe it at first. As trial dates for the couple loom, Brian Bettis makes a calculated decision. He pled and received a 35-year sentence. He was just as guilty as Susan because he was part of the crime. Our feeling was that Bettis had no idea she was going to shoot him. And we took that into account and talked to the family and, and reached this agreement. Susan Baker elects to take a different route. Her attorneys felt that she should be evaluated just to make sure she was competent and did not meet the insanity standards. A clinical psychologist testified that her continued drug use was affecting her ability to be competent to participate in the process. Years pass and Susan remains under doctor's care while her trial is postponed indefinitely. They kept postponing everything. They kept trying to say that she shouldn't be held accountable for her actions. And it was so frustrating that it got almost unbearable. The psychologist continued to work with her and then came back at some point and said she was competent to proceed to trial. Finally, in March of 2014, three years after Cliff's murder, the trial begins. Through an abundance of evidence, prosecutors lay out the motive for the shooting. They had basically killed him to rob him. I don't think this was a result of a mental illness. I think this was a result of she wanted money and she wanted the pills and she was willing to kill to get them. We testified, we went through all the videos. We watched her whole interview. The jury got to see every bit of evidence we had against both of them. Faced with an overwhelming amount of evidence against their client, Susan's lawyers make a case that she should not be convicted of felony murder. The argument was from the defense that she was guilty of reckless homicide, and basically what they argued was that the robbery was an afterthought. It really wasn't felony murder. It was a theft occurring after the man had died. After several days of testimony, Susan Baker is found guilty of felony murder, aggravated robbery, and setting fire to personal property. It only took him 15 minutes to, to convict her. 15 minutes. If you're convicted of felony murder in Tennessee, it is an automatic life sentence. Susan Baker will not be parole eligible until she has served 51 calendar years. My mom hates that she chose the path that she did, and she's just facing the consequences. It's all she can really do. For Cliff's children, the verdict proves little relief from the pain they continue to experience from losing their father. He did not deserve this. By no means, he did not deserve this. My dad was a loving, uh, caring father. A loving and caring grandfather. That's Clifford Carton. He was the kindest, most gentle person. And I want people to remember that. How much he, he loved everyone. information on snapped go to oxygen.com whatever's done in the dark is always going to come to the light Supervisor Don Moore is starting his morning routine at a trucking company in Fontana, California. It was a normal work day. I came in that morning at 5 o'clock, and as I did every morning, checked on everybody to make sure they were where they were supposed to be. He goes on the computer and checks what each driver is doing to make sure that everything's going fine. 56-year-old Albert Thomas should already be on the move. 
Albert was a dependable, very responsible individual who worked for me, and he was never late. That morning, Albert had a early delivery there down the street from where he lived. He didn't make the delivery, which is out of place for Albert. When I pulled up Albert's truck and saw the truck hadn't started, that's when I got concerned. Don is not the only one concerned. The rain hunter called Don Moore at the office uh, frantically uh, asking Don if he knew where her husband Albert was. Don told her that he didn't. However, he could track him down because there was a GPS device that was located inside of the truck. Don was kind of worried, so he asked me if I would go out there and see if I could find him. So I got in my truck and uh, I bobtailed out there in case his truck was broke down. A half hour later, Richard arrives at the GPS location in Moreno Valley, California. So that's when I seen his truck there. So closer I'm getting him, things looked out of place. His driver's side door was wide open. I went through the open driver's door and I was thinking something was up. He was right behind the driver's seat. He was on his knees and he was all the way forward, pitched forward, so his back was kind of flat. As soon as I seen him, I knew he was dead. Because I I don't know how you how you know that, but uh, you know that. That was instant. And that's when I called 911. Albert Thomas began life a world away from sunny Southern California. My dad was born in Hollandale, Mississippi, September 20th, 1953. He had a nice personality. He really did. You know, just got along with everybody. Just, just all around nice guy. Albert found love early in life when he met Helen Thomas. They kind of met riding the school bus together. They dated throughout their high school years. She got pregnant with me while she was still in high school. And then after she had me and she finished school, they married. At first, Albert supported his new family with a factory job. He had a great work ethic, nose to the grindstone. He was the breadwinner and he did that well. After working some years, he decided to go to truck driving school and he did truck driving throughout his life. Albert worked for me as a uh, local truck driver. He always, you know, was smiled, was dependable, always at work. You never had to worry about Albert. He wasn't home um, for weeks at a time, but he was just a good father, a great provider. While truck driving was profitable, over 20 years on the road eventually cost Albert his marriage. Mom and dad eventually separated after being together for a lot of years and naturally that was painful but understandable after the heartbreak of his divorce albert happened to run into an old acquaintance lorraine hunter lorraine became everything that you know he thought that he was missing albert and lorraine knew each other from childhood but they lost touch when lorraine's family moved to the west coast she had spent the majority of her childhood growing up in California. She was quiet, you know, reserved, kind of went with the flow. She would mingle, but she was still kind of, kind of quiet. She did have an eye for men. Throughout her 20s, Lorraine bounced from relationship to relationship in search of love. Though she never really found it, she was blessed with two sons along the way. Riedel. Um, is Lorraine Hunter's oldest son, and um, she also has another son by the name of Tremaine. At age 31, the single mother's long quest for love finally came to an end when she met 39-year-old Alan Brown. Alan was a truck driver, and he made good money. Alan was described as a calm, collected person. Over the course of 10 years, Lorraine and Alan had their ups and downs. Lorraine complained often about how they were struggling financially. During a break in the relationship, Lorraine had a fling that led to a pregnancy. Brianna was born July 22nd, 1993 in L.A. Lorraine was, she was very, very protective of Brianna. As they always did, Lorraine and Alan found their way back to each other, and Alan helped raise Brianna as his own. 
Lorraine Hunter and Alan Brown were raising three children, uh, Raydell, Tremaine, and then Rihanna, who was just a baby. Tragically, just three years later, their life together was cut short. March of 1996, Alan Brown was shot to death. And they were never able to apprehend or identify a suspect. He had gotten killed during a carjacking. When things started going bad for Lorraine, she was still trying to give her kids the world, you know, as best as she could. With her two sons now grown and out of the home, Lorraine found herself raising Brianna without the support of a partner. Lorraine gratefully accepted help from friends. She never had a job. She basically had nothing. My parents talked it over and, you know, gave a decision that they would, they would help out. They moved in with my parents. She was good at cooking and sewing and baking. She used to make cakes for my dad. He loved. She was able to help out. She picked up really quick. She was smart. Three years after Alan's death, a trip back home to Mississippi changed everything. It was there that Lorraine reconnected with Albert Thomas for the first time in decades. She was gone, you know, a couple weeks. And when she came back, she basically had a, a beautiful ring. And she was engaged to Albert. She had him relocate and come to California. Once Albert moved to California, life seemed really, really good for them. You know, they seemed genuinely happy. Albert strived to give his new family a happy life. They got married in a small chapel in Marina Valley. He looked after him. He worked hard. Um, he worked two jobs so that they could have money. He worked. She didn't. He had a good heart. He was a loving father. He was a good provider. Albert grew to love Lorraine's daughter, Brianna, as if she were his own. He gave her the world. He took excellent care of her. Brianna never wanted for anything. A shared new beginning promised a happy and prosperous future. But on November 4th, 2009, after more than 10 years together, tragedy strikes Lorraine and Albert's life when 911 dispatchers receive a frantic early morning call. I called them and said that somebody's been killed. They were out there uh, pretty quick. A lot of people started showing up and, and they started taping off the area. First responders quickly secure the scene. I was shook up. It's a memory that will never go away. It's a part where you have an ache in your heart about it because it uh, was a good friend that somebody did this to. I'll never forget it. Coming up, a gruesome crime scene offers few answers. There was quite a lot of blood. There was a blood trail coming out of the door of the truck. And investigators piece together a helpless victim's horrifying final moments. He was shot to death in a kneeling position. It was an execution. There was a lot of police department, fire department was there. There was, it was all taped off. 
Once a coroner arrives, then entry was made into the vehicle. He was actually found right behind both of the seats. Albert was wearing a red jumpsuit. I believe it had a stripe, but he was found on all fours um, with his head tucked inside of a small closet that was inside of the truck. The thing that really stands out about that crime scene is the way in which he died. He was shot to death, and he was shot to death in a kneeling position. It was an execution. After the body is transported to the morgue, investigators pick over the truck interior with a fine-toothed comb. There were some personal belongings that were um, on the floor in and around where his body was found. There were no shell casings found. So this is one of those things as an investigator that you're thinking is, where are the shell cases? Is one of two things happen. The most common is the gunman's revolver, and revolvers don't eject the casings. And the other thing that could happen is that they pick him up and take him with them. While the search for a murder weapon continues, detectives turn their attention to Albert's co-workers to learn more about their victim. I told them who I was, and then they brought me into the motor home with Richard, and then that's when I started talking to the police department. Both me and him had to talk with the detectives, and they had to obviously rule me out as a suspect, I guess, so they took pictures of my shoes and all this stuff. They asked questions on everything that, uh, that happened that morning. They were just asking, you know, did he work for me, why Albert's truck was there. He routinely parked his truck in this big dirt lot because it was only a couple blocks from where he lived. You could almost actually see his truck from the balcony of his apartment. Detectives ask Albert's co-worker, Richard, if anything seemed out of place in Albert's cab when he discovered his body. I did notice in the truck, because Albert kept his truck uh, nice and neat on the inside, it was a mess. Didn't look like he kept it. He kept it immaculate. So somebody did that. It wasn't him. The first thing you think is robbery. And the way he was found could have definitely been a robbery. But a careful examination of the truck cab's contents doesn't reveal anything to support that theory. Nothing not notable is missing from the truck. As far as the robbery, which, which you're thinking at the beginning, that sort of drifted away pretty quick. If Albert wasn't the victim of a robbery or hijacking, was his execution-style murder something more personal? His co-workers say it's highly unlikely. I couldn't understand why anybody would do this to this man. He was just too easy going and too caring for somebody to want to do that. Riverside County homicide detective Ken Patterson visits Albert's wife, Lorraine, at their apartment not far from the crime scene. I didn't go in, and I never do, going in and say, hey, your husband's dead. That's not how you make notification. So I just started querying her as to her relationship to Albert. Also at the apartment is Lorraine's 16-year-old daughter, Brianna. Ken noted that when he interacted with both Lorraine and Brianna, that they both appeared to be uh, really upset, really emotional. I started talking to her. When's the last time you saw him? Uh, what was he wearing? She told Ken Patterson that the last time that she saw Albert was the night before, uh, on November 3rd, 2009. Albert held two jobs, she told me. He was a truck driver, and he worked at an auto parts store. A truck driver was his main job. He would leave early in the morning to do local jobs. Detective Patterson tactfully briefs Lorraine on the situation. I did tell her that his truck had been found and that we did find a deceased body inside the truck. But I did tell her that I could not at that point in time say that it was Albert because the autopsy hadn't been performed, but I was pretty sure that's who it was. The news brings Lorraine to tears. She did cry. She explains, I've been trying to call Albert. I didn't know where he was. I called his company. I asked them where Albert was. Uh, they couldn't tell me. Ken also asked some basic questions to try to get any other information that could be pertinent to the investigation. We just covered all the basics, and then I departed and told her that I would be back. Police hope legwork on the streets will provide answers. Patrol officers start fanning out in the neighborhood and seeing if there's any witnesses, uh, looking for any type of surveillance cameras or any cameras that might have saw something. The sheriff's department talked to neighbors and people who worked in the area to see if anyone saw anything on the night of November 3rd, 2009, or the morning of November 4th, 2009. We were knocking doors, talking to witnesses. We were on foot covering 
you know, miles and miles around the area to see if we could find any evidence to try and figure out exactly what happened. Unfortunately, they weren't able to find any witnesses who saw anything. After hitting dead end after dead end, police reach out to the public. They didn't have any suspects in custody. They put out their phone number and the We Tip hotline in order to try to generate some kind of response from the public. But at the time, it was very threadbare information. This isn't a case that was solved in 48 hours. This isn't a case that was solved in a week. There was no evidence. Coming up, another brutal murder conjures up familiar circumstances. He got shot in the back, but he didn't identify what was the shot of him. And detectives uncover a startling provision with a big payout. If the insured was murdered, the proceeds from that policy upon his death would double. Homicide detectives in Riverside County, California, are determined to solve the execution-style murder of 56-year-old truck driver Albert Thomas. Essentially, all we knew at the time was there had been a homicide, and God knows what had happened. Okay. The ME's post-mortem exam tells police more about the crime and the type of weapon used. Bullet fragments uh, from a 38 caliber revolver were found in his body. When he performed the autopsy, he opined that Albert had been shot twice in the back of the head and then also twice in the back. If a gun is located, ballistics can connect the bullet fragments to that weapon. Nothing in the autopsy report indicates Albert fought his killer. It leaves kind of a, a raw taste in your mouth when you hear about someone being shot in the back and, and not being given an opportunity to at least you know, beg for their life or try to shield themselves. With still no clear direction on a suspect, detectives dig deeper into the victim's personal life. Investigator Patterson was talking to family members of Albert, trying to wrap his head around, you know, information about Albert, who he was, and any other information that might be pertinent to the investigation. Albert's close-knit Mississippi family is still reeling from the news of his death. I can remember just trying to run away, thinking, I'm not hearing this, this isn't happening. And I remember looking at my husband and just shaking my head because I could not believe that my father was gone. Katina Thomas revealed to Investigator Patterson that she was aware that Lorraine Hunter's first husband had been murdered back in 1996. And so from there, Investigator Patterson obtained reports related to that murder investigation and began the process of trying to connect the dots. March of 1996, Alan Brown, truck driver, was shot to death in the city of Inglewood. On that day, Alan and Lorraine were visiting a niece. They left the residence there in Inglewood and then went to Alan's vehicle. Lorraine indicated that she told Alan that there was a clicking sound or some sort of sound that was coming from the hood. He did get out to check the oil because something was wrong, and uh, this is when he was shot. She heard a pop, and she turned around, and he was on the ground, but there was no one else around. When police arrived, Alan told police that he got shot in the back, but he didn't identify who it was that shot him. Alan was then taken to the hospital and treated for a few days for his shotgun wound to the back, but he subsequently died in the hospital. As he digs deeper into the case file, Detective Patterson uncovers one interesting detail. After Alan Brown's murder, Lorraine Hunter collected approximately $312,000 in life insurance proceeds. The investigation into Alan Brown's death proved inconclusive at the time. Just from the information that I obtained, it looked like a solvable case, but it wasn't. It was left open. The circumstances surrounding Alan's death raised suspicions for the family of Lorraine's second husband, Albert. When I spoke with Mr. Thomas's sister and daughter from Mississippi, they told me that they suspected Lorraine had killed her first husband. Detective Patterson goes straight to Albert's workplace to inquire about Albert's life insurance. Albert Thomas's boss confirmed to me that Mr. Thomas actually had life insurance policies. That life insurance policy on its face was worth approximately 225000 but there was a, a contingency to the life insurance policy that noted that if 
the insured Albert Thomas was murdered, the proceeds from that policy upon his death would double. The existence of this hefty insurance payout is particularly surprising news. Detective Patterson, when he talked to Lorraine the first time, she told him that she wasn't aware of any life insurance policies. Okay, so I have $450,000 worth of life insurance, but yet Lorraine Hunter says he has no life insurance. But according to Don Moore, insurance money was very much on Lorraine's mind in the hours after Albert's murder. I'm told by Albert Thomas's boss that he had spoken to Albert's wife, told her that morning that, yes, there was life insurance policies. And the fact she was calling out life insurance so quickly just stunned me. I mean, personally, myself, that's the last thing I'm thinking about. Detective Patterson puts the insurance question to Lorraine a second time. We're going back to Lorraine's house. I actually asked her again. I said, do you recall any life insurance policies that Albert had? And I told her that I had talked to his boss. She said, oh, yes. It wasn't a defensive thing. It wasn't you're accusing me of anything. It was just, oh, yes. Okay, I recall now. An absent-minded omission doesn't make Lorraine a murderer. I told her I would be getting back in touch with her. I, we always explain that, you know, the investigation is ongoing as we're going to try to figure out what happened. Investigators dig deeper into Albert and Lorraine's assets. They had life insurance policies in addition to the one that he already had through his trucking company. And the entire amount, I believe, summed up to just over a million dollars. It appeared to me she obviously kept that from me. So now, red flags are starting to go up. So this made Detective Patterson suspicious. So he put a hole in the death certificate for the coroner's office. So she wasn't able to collect on any of the insurance policies without the death certificate. I go back to Lorraine, and I want to see if she wants to voluntarily take a polygraph test. She agreed to it, said fine and dandy, set up a date and time, which was the following day. I show up, she's not there. Doesn't answer the door, doesn't answer her phone obvious she's avoiding this. She's avoiding me. I can't get a hold of her for a week. I get a letter in the mail from an attorney saying he's her attorney and to leave her alone and to quit contacting her. I'm like, hmm, okay. As much as Detective Patterson hates to admit it, the investigation has hit a roadblock. Because there were no witnesses and because there was no physical evidence that could support further investigation of a suspect, the case was suspended. It was still being actively worked by the Sheriff's Department. However, there were no suspects. In so many words, the case went cold. For now, Riverside County Homicide's caseload pushes Albert Thomas's murder to the back burner. It's agonizing. You're in Mississippi. You talk to a detective and they tell you, you know, they're going to keep you posted. And they do as much as they can and you call every day starting out and then every week and then eventually you're not able to get anyone on the phone you want to just not have hope anymore but i chose to believe that the people responsible for his death would would eventually be brought to justice then on october 6 2011 almost two years into the investigation of albert's death a surprise twist brings new life to the case Riverside County deputies respond to a shoplifting call involving a teenage girl. She had been arrested on a misdemeanor shoplifting charge. She asked if she could speak to a detective. She indicated to the arresting officer for her shoplifting that she had information about Albert Thomas's death. Coming up, an unexpected confession brings detectives within striking distance. She admitted to being present when Albert was shot. And lifting a veil of lies puts an informant in jeopardy. Well, the only reason that this could be happening is somebody's a snitch and you're the one. October 6, 2011. Nearly two years after the unsolved murder of California trucker Albert Thomas. Riverside County deputies responding to a routine shoplifting call are surprised when the teen girl they take into custody makes an unusual request. She asked specifically to speak with the detective that was involved in Albert Thomas's death. Detective Ken Patterson takes a seat in an interview room opposite the girl, Shanice Hunter. I told her I was the primary investigator and I was the one investigating Albert's death and she just, she came out with it. 
Shanice told us that it had been weighing on her conscience for you know, almost two years, the fact that this person had been murdered and that she knew exactly who was responsible for it. She said that the thing that prevented her from saying something sooner is the fact that she didn't want to be disloyal to her family. Lorraine was an aunt and um, Brianna was a cousin. She was torn between the family bond and the fact that what happened to Albert shouldn't have happened. She tells me that Lorraine and Brianna both were involved in Albert's death. The day before Mr. Thomas was killed, she actually walked into Lorraine's apartment and Brianna was sitting inside the apartment holding a revolver. She knew that it startled them when she walked in. They pretty much tell her to leave. She said that she overheard Brianna say something to the effect of, are you sure we have to do this to her mother, Lorraine? And Shanice said at that time, Lorraine told her daughter, Brianna, yes, he's going to leave us and we don't have any money. According to Shanice, later that night, Lorraine, Brianna, and Albert went on a family walk. They'd always exercise, they'd go walk together. He had a walking stick and, and Shanice said the three of them left with the walking stick. Several hours passed. All of a sudden she gets a phone call and it's Brianna telling her, hey, go get mom's car keys, get the car, and freaking come over across from the school and pick us up. Shanice then described how she drove both Lorraine and Brianna back to Lorraine's apartment. And once they got there, Lorraine instructed Brianna to take off her clothes. And then Lorraine took those clothes, washed them, and then instructed Brianna to take them out to the trash dumpster outside, indicating to both of them that it would be okay because the trash collection was going to happen the next day. Shanice's interview has broken the case wide open. But to secure an arrest warrant and a conviction, investigators will need more. I need to get one of them to admit to it is what I need to happen. That investigators go to uh, Rihanna's school in San Bernardino to wait to pick her up. And I had Shanice agree to wear a wire and go in to talk to Lorraine as this is happening. So I'm in Moreno Valley with Shanice and Lorraine. Investigators are picking up Brianna and San Bernardino all at the same time because we needed it to be coordinated. So Shanice goes in and tells Lorraine, hey, they're arresting Brianna for killing Albert. And basically what Lorraine tells Shanice is, well, the only reason that this could be happening is somebody's a freaking snitch and you're the one. So she's like, we're leaving. As detectives apprehensively monitor the conversation, officers are ready to swoop in. This could be a situation that could be bad because we really suspect that Lorraine killed Albert. And so Lorraine and Shanice are now leaving. They basically come down the stairs, there's nothing else really said, and we arrested her because we couldn't let her get anywhere else because we didn't know what was going to happen. Lorraine is transported to Moreno Valley Police Headquarters, unaware that detectives have already begun questioning her 18-year-old daughter, Brianna. I first spoke with Brianna, and Brianna ultimately admits that her mom shot Albert. She said she saw her mother pointed at Albert's back and then fire the weapon twice. Detectives confront Lorraine with Brianna's accusation. She's told that she can save her daughter if she admits to shooting Albert. I told Lorraine I knew that she's the one that killed him. But she never admitted to it to me, never tried to save her daughter, nothing. Lorraine could have cared less. After interviews at the Reno Valley Police Department, I ultimately arrested them for the murder of Albert. Both of them were charged with first degree murder, also conspiracy to commit murder. And then Lorraine was charged with the special circumstances alleging that the murder was committed while lying in wait, and then also that she did it for financial gain. Finally, Detective Patterson can make a few long-awaited phone calls. Before he even said his name, I recognized his voice. Detective Kim Patterson, he said, I'm calling you to notify you that an arrest has been made in the case of Albert Thomas. And I fell to my knees and I cried. But when he told me it was Lorraine, I thought to myself, oh my gosh. And, and then he said, and Brianna Hunter. And I thought, oh my Lord. Even though charges have been filed, police must work to gather more evidence against Lorraine and Brianna. Shanice was interviewed several times after Lorraine and Brianna were arrested for Albert's murder. And during the course of those interviews, Shanice revealed to my investigator, Paul Edwards, 
that Lorraine Hunter obtained the gun from a friend of hers who went to church with Lorraine and then kept the possession of it for at least a couple of months and then later returned it. Investigators quickly obtain a search warrant for the friend's apartment. Upon the execution of that search warrant, a 38 caliber revolver was found hidden in a drawer in the bedroom. I booked into evidence in the DA's office, and they did the send it to the DOJ for ballistics. The results confirm the bullet fragments found during Albert's autopsy are a match. The gun I recovered was the gun that was used to kill Albert Thomas. Coming up, a complete picture of the crime emerges. Whatever's done in the dark is always going to come to the light. And a calculating killer plots to up the body count. She wanted her dead, and she was willing to pay money to do it. Prosecutors preparing to try Lorraine Hunter for the brutal execution-style slaying of her husband, Albert, are counting on Lorraine's daughter and accomplice, Brianna, for answers. Although we had worked up the case and there was a lot of evidence implicating both Brianna and Lorraine, of course we wanted to know more details. But before they can reach an agreement with Brianna's lawyer, there is yet another stunning development in the case. There were several letters we intercepted uh, from Lorraine to Brianna. And in the letters that she sent to Brianna, she was trying to dissuade Brianna from testifying against her. In the lead up to trial, Lorraine's cellmate comes forward with more shocking information. She tells authorities Lorraine is trying to hire an assassin to keep the prosecution's other witness, her own niece, silent for good. That's when police launch a plot of their own. The deputy sent an undercover deputy um, to have a meeting with Lorraine in, in the jail, and he pretended to be a hitman. This undercover officer had several conversations that were recorded with Lorraine Hunter, where Lorraine Hunter, in fact, confirmed that she wanted her niece, Shanice, dead, and that she was willing to pay money to do it. She felt that if Shanice was eliminated as a witness, that her and her daughter would walk free. He agreed to, to kill Shanice for Lorraine. The undercover officer told Lorraine that he would need more information about Shanice, namely address and pictures. From there, Lorraine Hunter, uh, started calling several family members, asking them to send her pictures of Shanice. That investigation was concluded, and our office filed a separate case against Lorraine Hunter for solicitation for murder. For a chance at a lesser sentence, Brianna signals she's ready to do business with the state. If we find that the information is credible, then we'll consider giving an offer of leniency to that co-defendant if they agree to cooperate in the investigation and in the prosecution of the other co-defendant. And that's what happened in this case. Brianna's attorney indicated that she was willing to talk to us to fill in all the blanks. And what she revealed to us in that interview was powerful. Brianna sits down with state attorneys on September 19th, 2013. She says in the year leading up to the murder, her mother was obsessed with money. According to Brianna, Lorraine was upset and frustrated quite often with Albert because he wasn't making enough money. Brianna says that Albert's two jobs and a company insurance package wouldn't assure Lorraine of a bright enough financial future. Brianna told us that Lorraine not only had them fill out life insurance applications for several companies, but that she personally witnessed Lorraine forge Albert's signature. Brianna reveals her mother had tried to cash in several times. She had attempted three other times to try to kill Albert, and it was just the wrong time, too many people around. And on November 3rd, 2009, Lorraine finally had the right opportunity. She led us through the, uh, the night in question when Albert was murdered. They walked to the truck, and Albert told that Brianna that he bought her a sweatshirt, and he was in the truck. So they all got in the truck. Albert got in the back. And he was kneeling on the floor, trying to get the sweatshirt out of a small cabinet or closet. And at this point, Lorraine was in the passenger seat and Brianna was in the driver's seat. And Lorraine managed to get around into the back and was standing behind Albert. And she shot him in the back. Lorraine's trial begins in June 2017. Prosecutors begin their case with 
with a glimpse of Lorraine and Albert's disintegrating marriage. Their relationship wasn't that good. They were married, they slept in separate bedrooms, they argued about money a lot. Albert had made a decision that he was actually going to leave Lorraine because he couldn't do it anymore. He was working himself to death. But the most damning testimony occurs when cooperating witness Brianna takes the stand. Most memorable part of the trial was Brianna Hunter sitting across from her mom, basically less than 15 feet away, and detailing all of what her mother did in trying to eventually kill Albert Thomas. The jury announces their verdict on August 21st, 2017. The jury rendered a guilty verdict for a first-degree murder, a guilty verdict for conspiracy to commit murder, and they also found true both of those special allegations. She went on through the penalty phase, and the jury recommended the death penalty, and Judge Fisher was supportive of that. He imposed the death sentence on Lorraine Hunter in December of 2017. Brianna's cooperation keeps her from joining Lorraine on death row. Brianna Hunter uh, entered uh, the plea agreement with the Riverside County District Attorney's Office. She pleaded guilty to three counts of attempted murder and one count of voluntary manslaughter. She received a total sentence of 18 years and nine months. I really think that Albert and Brianna had a good relationship, but mom drug her into this. I saw emotions in her, I mean, tears. After more than eight years of grief and anger, Lorraine's conviction gives Albert's family the justice they've prayed for. We cried, we were pleased, we were relieved, and that's where closure actually came. Albert is being remembered as a great man, a great husband, an awesome father, an awesome grandfather, co-worker, friend, just all around human being. I have forgiven Brianna. I have forgiven Lorraine. I don't want hatred in my heart toward anyone. Um, because in that case, you're no better than that person that committed the crime. information on snap go to oxygen.com he was a successful car salesman and she was his beautiful wife Just if there's any little detail that you have omitted to this point now is the time you tell us what kind of horrible person does that how can you look somebody in the eye and do that to me Saturday, February 28th, 2015, Round Rock, Texas. At around 1 p.m., the Williamson County Sheriff's Office gets an alarming 911 call. Yes, sir, this is an emergency. There's a fatality here at the house. Permit, please. I need somebody permit, please. Yes, sir, this is an emergency. There's a fatality here at the house. Permit, please. Deputies arrive on the scene moments later. The patrol, they go in and clear the home. They find the victim in the master bath. He was lying on his back, face up, and he had a really large gunshot wound to the, his forehead. It was pretty alarming. There was a great deal of blood underneath his body. There's obviously a deceased person there, and clearly it's a murder. The victim is identified as the home's owner, 34-year-old Ali Khan. He was an assistant manager at a car dealership in Round Rock. To determine what happened, deputies turned to the two witnesses on the scene. The man who placed the 911 call, Alex Bedoya, and the victim's wife, Nancy Khan. Ali was supposed to be at work on Saturday and didn't show up. And so his boss started texting him and calling him worried. Ali 
Ali's co-worker, Alex Bedoya, tells police that no one had seen Ali since his last shift two days earlier. So their boss sent him to Ali's house to check on him. You have a guy that shows up every day and shows up on a certain time, and then one day you don't show up for hours, and you don't answer the phone. I mean, you know something's wrong. He checked all the doors. Everything seemed locked. He's getting concerned because Ali's two vehicles were in the driveway, so he should have been there. The young man tells the deputies that's when he called Ali's wife, Nancy, who said she had stayed the night at a friend's house and had no idea what was going on. She ends up showing up to the residence. At that point in time, she goes in. The co-worker is standing at the door when he hears her scream. He goes in to see what happened and finds Nancy on the ground next to Ollie's body, and she's saying something like, they killed him, they killed him. The oldest of three children, Ali Khan was born in 1980 and grew up in a family with high expectations. His parents were doctors, so they're highly educated. I think his folks wanted him to be a doctor or something like that, and he was really smart. Ali was also gifted with a magnetic personality and had no trouble making friends. Real happy guy, always make you laugh. He was just super friendly. He had friends all over the place, and he, and he could start a conversation with anyone. He was like one of the most lovable, likable guys. Everybody loved him. He was the kind of guy that would uh, give you the shirt off his back. In 1998, Ali headed off to college with his sights set on becoming a doctor. But it was during a summer job at a car dealership in 2002 that Ali found his true calling. He was a salesman, man. He could he could make a he could sell a car like like anything. He really enjoyed, you know, just making the sale, just making some money. Ali enjoyed selling cars so much, in fact, that he decided to change his career path and stay at the dealership full time. Once you get in the car business, if you really like and you're good at it, nobody really goes back to college. He really loved the business. He really wanted to sell cars and make customers happy. We worked 80 to 100 hours a week, especially when we first started. I mean, we were there all day and all night, every day. Although initially disappointed, Ali's parents eventually came to understand and respect their son's decision. They seem like a very close-knit family, a very loving family, very connected. Ali's success at the dealership earned him the attention of his supervisors, who rewarded him with a new Rolex watch. He always wore it all the time, yeah. When you get a Rolex, you show everybody your, your awesome Rolex. He wanted to live the life, you know what I mean? He liked nice cars and he liked jewelry. In 2006, Ali received a promotion to manager that transferred him to a dealership in Houston about three hours east. Soon after that, he met a beautiful woman named Nancy Flores, just two years his junior. She was pretty and she liked him. I mean, what else can a guy ask for, you know? She probably just showed him lots of love and, he, you know, he had someone to spend time with and spend his money on. Unlike Ali, Nancy didn't come from a close-knit family. Her parents died in a car accident when she was a child. She kind of kept to herself, quiet not really talkative. Despite her reserved nature, Nancy connected to Ali in a way no woman had before. And a few years later, when Ali returned to Round Rock to manage a new dealership, Nancy came with him. They had a long courtship. They were madly in love, and, you know, that was his soulmate. Back in his hometown and with Nancy by his side, Ali continued on his upward trajectory at the dealership. He made tons of money for the company. He opened up two different stores, a chain of dealerships. He trained people. He did so much for the company, above and beyond. He was a go-to guy. You know, he pretty much was the backbone of that dealership. Ali also made a large enough salary that Nancy didn't have to work. Fine dining, luxury goods, and European vacations became a way of life for the couple. I went over to this house and I opened the door up and I'm just like, you live in this? Like, this is huge. It's echoing, you know? And I was like super impressed. He's a great guy. He's done well for himself, has a beautiful house. He has probably a, a big bank account, could take some nice vacations. There's security for Nancy. 
September of 2014, after four years together, the couple announced that they were expecting a baby. She had told him it was going to be a boy, and that's all we kept talking about. It was a boy, it's a boy, it's a boy, it's a boy, you know? We're going to get the playgrounds and the seesaws and rope swings and all that kind of stuff. Just three months later, the couple tied the knot in a private ceremony. She was pregnant. They just got married. He's at a successful car dealership. They seemed like lovebirds. Everything was great. Now the Khan's hopes and dreams have been shattered when Ali is found shot to death in their home. And police must answer, who would kill this successful car salesman and why? Coming up. Clues at the crime scene reveal details about Ali's last moments. Whoever did this was making sure he was going to die. And detectives uncover some troubling secrets from Ali Khan's personal life. She indicated that he liked to use pills. She made them. Ali Khan, the manager of a successful car dealership in Round Rock, Texas, has just been discovered shot to death in his home. Mr. Khan was laying face up uh, on the floor with his head towards the door. And there's a close contact wound of a gunshot wound to his forehead. There's just a massive amount of blood on the floor. And there was just blood all the way to the master closet, which was at the back of the bathroom. In my opinion, there was no belief that um, he committed suicide based on the scene itself. There was no weapon. There was, no, there was nothing that indicated suicide at that point. As homicide investigators escort Ali's wife, Nancy, and his friend, Alex, back to the station for questioning, CSIs begin analyzing the crime scene. He was shot nine times. There were entrance wounds both to his back side and to his front, indicating that his body was moving as he was being shot. And then the last shot was, was to his forehead at a close distance. Despite the number of times Ali had been shot, CSIs only find one 9mm shell casing at the scene. The shell casing was recovered um, from behind the door. So it would seem that somebody had collected the shell casings and there was one that they had overlooked. We were able to see that there were bullet holes in him, uh, but it just didn't make sense on why there was nothing broken, no rounds that had gone through because of the, the, the shell casing 9mm round that they recovered. It appears that whoever killed Ali removed other items as well. In the closet, it was very evident that there was a chunk of clothing missing. It's just that it was very clear that someone like took a big chunk of stuff and moved it. Had robbery been the killer's motive? It seems possible given the Khan's wealth. He's done well for himself, has a beautiful house. Maybe somebody broke into the house and thought this guy's gotta have money. Before she'd been escorted to the police station, Nancy Khan had mentioned she believed that a few of her husband's possessions were missing. There was some statements about watches that were taken, some money. There was $10,000. It was inside a coat pocket in the closet. But a quick glance around the home seems to dispel the theory that robbery had been the killer's primary motive. The house would have been ransacked and rummaged through. I mean, it didn't appear that way. The house was locked up. There was no signs of broken windows or torn window screens or anything. It was. It seemed like whoever went in there had access to that house. Based on the blood trail and bullet wounds, detectives theorize that Ali was first shot while he was standing... The blood that was in there you, on the walls itself, you could tell that he had a, a wound on his, on his forearm. And so it's believed that that was probably the first shot, a defensive, because there's spatter on the wall. There was blood all on the clothing that was in the closet. So clearly something happened in that closet for the blood to have spattered throughout the clothing. After being shot once, the evidence suggests that Ali tried to run to the bathroom door to escape and was shot seven more times until he fell on the floor and was ultimately executed by a gunshot to the forehead. At that point in time, we, we had no idea who the suspect would be, who could have possibly done this. The shot to his forehead, you have to look someone right in the eye when you do that. I don't see how that could be anything but personal, very angry, and horrific. When police notify Ali's parents of his death, they are devastated. They're really good people, very kind. 
you could see just enormous, tremendous loss in their eyes, especially with the father. It isn't long before word of the horrific crime spreads through town. I've lost it. I still can't believe it. I can't. It's hard. It's so shocking. It just... It's not a phone call you expect. It just didn't seem real. Like, it's like a punch. It's like a punch to the heart. Everybody was speechless. I think even then, when I close that day, because it just, you know, it's like, like empty space. When this happens, of course, there's shock and concern. Who would be mad at Ollie? Back at the sheriff's office, detectives question Ali's widow, Nancy Khan, as well as his friend and co-worker, Alex Bedoya. Are you aware of any enemies that you have? No. I don't know. I mean, you said he's a pretty fun guy. He's generally well-liked. You're saying about it. You can't stand him. No, I mean, this, I just had a word. Badass guy. Cool guy. You know, not the kind of guy that makes much enemies. No, 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 no. He just seemed shaken a little, um, just in the sense of what he had seen. So I don't know that it was anything, there wasn't anything suspicious or anything that pointed out that, that for him at the time. Ali's widow, Nancy, who is seven months pregnant, is also unable to think of anyone who might have wanted to harm her husband. She tells police that the last time she saw Ali was Thursday night. She admits they had a fight that evening, and Ali had ended up going out with a friend who went by the nickname Turkey. She didn't like Turkey. She, she, she thought he was bad news, according to her statement. Nancy says she got worried when Ali didn't come home that night. He also didn't return her calls. So she left, went search for him that night. She kept coming back by the house. She came by the house at 1 a.m., and then at 3 a.m. to see if he was there to see if he had noticed that she had packed up and left and then it eventually drove off to go visit a friend about 80 miles away in Stockdale. Nancy claims she never heard from or saw her husband again until earlier that morning when she got the worried phone call from Alex. Detectives ask her if Ali might have been hiding any secrets that could have led to his death. She indicated that he liked to use pills and smoke some marijuana. She made some statements related to other drugs. He frequents strip clubs I and mean, liked to party, so to speak. He was kind of wild at night, and um, he would go to clubs and go party. Coming up. Police take a closer look at Ali's secret party lifestyle and find a possible motive. The way the murder went down and the bullet between the head, we thought, maybe this is a drug cartel. Detectives in Round Rock, Texas, are investigating the gruesome murder of car salesman Ali Khan. He gets shot in the body, chest several times, and then he gets shot between the eyes, like a mob hit. Ali's widow, Nancy, tells detectives that the last time she saw her husband, he'd left to hang out with a friend named Turkey. She also admits that Ali had a dark side that involved drugs and strip clubs. That's one thing that concerned us is that is there somebody that, you know, could have gone home with him or, you know, somebody from that lifestyle might have been a suspect. Police need to find Ali's friend Turkey to learn what happened the night he vanished. Unfortunately, Nancy doesn't know Turkey's real name or his phone number. But as CSIs are wrapping up the crime scene at the Khan residence, a car parks on the street outside. There was a friend that had shown up and was really, really upset. The friend identifies himself as Turkey. Police are eager to find out what he knows about Ali Khan's last night alive. He followed the patrol to the sheriff's office and ultimately he was interviewed at the sheriff's office. Turkey, uh, yeah, I love Turkish. Turkey tells detectives he'd been at home on Thursday evening when he received a call from Ali. There was 
They had gone to several strip clubs and that evening him and Turkey after Ali and Nancy had gotten to a fight and she had scratched him and I think the word was used is she was crazy or she was becoming crazy. Almost like um, things were coming to an end or, or were in process of being ended. We've been having problems with her for a long time. Well, tell me about some of this. Just, I mean, okay, I mean, he's a great guy. He, 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 was, he was the best part of the ride, I think. You know, he, he frequented the uh, establishments, like the two bars and stuff like that. Turkey tells detectives that he and Ali had visited various strip clubs and bars that evening before parting ways at approximately 2 a.m. Ali had taken him home and they were still conversing either on the phone or through text messages until Ali got home. So from what Turkey said, Ali got home safe that night and then just didn't ever hear from him again. Turkey claims the last message he received from Ali was around 3 a.m which means Ali was murdered sometime between 3 a.m. November 13th, 2009, Moody, Missouri. It's a quiet Friday night as Corporal Clinton Howell of the Missouri Highway Patrol drives down a desolate stretch of highway. I was on duty by myself that night. I was taking my calls, doing what I normally do. Uh, when troop headquarters called me and said that there was an accident with injuries. A man and his wife were driving down the road. They saw this vehicle parked on the side of the road with the headlights on. As they drove by, they saw the woman lying on the road. And I started moving that way very, very quickly. Lights and sirens as fast as I can possibly get there. The quicker you can get there to somebody that is injured, the quicker you have a chance of saving their life. Within minutes, Corporal Howell arrives on the scene. I roll up on it, come flying out of my vehicle. The victim is laying in the center of the road, crumpled up. She was early 20s, uh, five foot tall, maybe 100 pounds. She was just very small, petite. She was still warm to the touch, had no pulse. She was already deceased. At first glance, how the young woman died is a mystery. There was no trauma, no clothes tore up where maybe a vehicle had struck her. There was just some blood oozing out beside her head, just a small amount. Corporal Howell then attempts to ID the victim. He went ahead and opened the door of the vehicle and went through the purse, and he found a driver's license. The young woman's name is Becky Dillard. I had my hands full. I'm out there by myself. I've got a young lady dead in the middle of the road, and then I have to shut down the highway. It was quite chaotic. In 1985, Becky always stood out. Becky was Miss Chris. She was like, I think, eight or nine when she started getting clothes to match. Her hair had to be perfect, everything. I don't think she really set out to be the center of attention, but in that little bit, she just ended up being the center of attention. By high school, Becky was getting plenty of attention from boys too, especially classmate Justin Dillard. Everybody loved her. She was very popular. She's beautiful. and. And we hit it off right off the bat. So I knew she's going to be my friend. He was just like Becky. His clothes had to match. His hair had to be fixed. Becky would always call him whenever something was going on and she needed someone to talk to. Justin was very sweet to my sister. They were the best of friends. They shared everything together and hung around with each other all the time. It wasn't until after graduation that Becky and Justin became more than best friends. When we got together, I knew that I could never do any better. And I was very lucky to even be with her because she didn't know how perfect she was. But I did. When Becky came to me and told me that she was in love with Justin, I really wasn't surprised. I feel like we hit it off so well because we were a lot alike. We are both very into fashion. Um, we both wanted to go to school to do hair. I mean, it was perfect. Becky decided to go to cosmetology school. And Justin decided to go as well. The couple hadn't been dating long before they took their next big step together. We were going to have a baby. We were terrified because we were young. We were married. When Becky told me she was pregnant, I knew she was going to be an awesome mom already. So I just gave her a hug and told her I'd be there for her. 
Justin's mom, Deborah Dillard, was so thrilled by the news that she and her boyfriend, Billy Eastep, made room in Deborah's home for the couple and future grandchild. My mother was very excited to have a, a little baby in the house, especially mine. It's an extension of me. I'm an extension of her. Deborah had spent her entire life looking after people. That was her calling, to take care of people. She graduated from nursing school, top of her class, and was a charge nurse at nursing homes. Deborah would tell Becky, don't worry about anything, I'll take care of everything, and I'll guide you through this because I've had children before, so I know what I'm doing. True to her word, Deborah was right by Becky and Justin's side in May of 2005 when the couple welcomed their son, Kobe, into the world. She was all like smiling, crying, her first grandbaby and stuff like that. She was so proud of Becky and what she did and telling Becky she did a good job. She was ecstatic about Kobe and we were kind of ecstatic to have her because we didn't have to pay a babysitter. And we were still in school, so we'd get up, get him ready, get him to her, go to school and come home and have all the free time we wanted with him. Deborah was very, very serious about the care for Kobe. She would take care of him like she would any grandma would do for their grandbabies. In August of 2005, with three-month-old Kobe in tow, Becky and Justin married. She was my best friend, and who, who better to marry besides your best friend? I mean, it was perfect. Becky and Justin got married at Deborah's home, got married in the backyard. They had chairs set up, and a wedding cake was outside, and it was kind of a party situation. Becky was very happy at the wedding. Uh, Kobe was in it um, as Justin walked down the aisle. He carried Kobe with them up there, as I said, you know, their vows. With Deborah still looking after their little boy, Becky and Justin finished cosmetology school and both started working at a salon in the area. As a family, we were a team, and as a team, we were all very happy. Everything we needed was taken care of. If I couldn't provide it, Becky would provide it. If Becky couldn't provide it, my mom would. Deborah was really sweet, very, 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 very sweet woman. Um, she was always caring. She actually treated my sister like a daughter. In 2008, Deborah had even more reason to bond with her daughter-in-law after Becky gave birth to a little girl named Cricket. My mom and Becky got along a whole lot better than sometimes my mom and I did. Though as close as Becky had become to Deborah, she and Justin still dreamed of one day having a place of their own. Our goal was to have an apartment or something somewhere. I know that Becky and Justin were trying to find a place, you know, alone away from the parents, had their own privacy, but it took longer than they expected. Becky and Justin were happy. They raised their children together. They seemed to be in a good relationship. Everybody's dream is to have a son and then a daughter, and that's what we had. We had a perfect life, and they went to hell in a handbasket. The once happy family is ripped apart when a Missouri highway patrolman finds Becky dead on an isolated highway on the evening of November 13th, 2009. Vehicles on the shoulder, she was laying in the middle of the road. So they just made the assumption that it was a crash, somebody ejected, and they called in. But Corporal Clinton Howell quickly discovers this was no accident. There was a couple of shell casings in the road, what appeared to be 22 caliber shell casings. He was the first one to uh, make that determination that she'd been shot. It was a small caliber gunshot wound to her left temple between the ear and the eye. There was also another gunshot wound to the back of her head. It was so obvious that it was a murderer. Uh, I contact her and tell them that I need an investigator to respond immediately. Coming up, detectives piece together the grisly scene. It was a hit, plain and simple. And the death notification raises a red flag. He was grieving before he knew what he should be grieving about. On November 13th, 2009, Missouri Highway Patrol Officer Clinton Howell has just discovered 24-year-old Becky Dillard dead from what appears to be two gunshot wounds. She was still very warm, so I was just minutes behind the shooter. And I'm on by myself. I have nobody else. I have no backup. I have nothing. So, yeah, you've got to be on point. You've got to keep your head on a swivel and then do everything you can to preserve the evidence. When investigators arrive minutes later, they first take note of the crime's peculiar setting. With where it was located out in the middle of nowhere, I mean, it's 
It's not a case of she, there were stop signs or any reason she would be stopped where she's at. The vehicle is still running, so it's obvious it wasn't car problems. What could have motivated the murder is also a mystery. You would think that if somebody was looking to steal something, they would have, take the car, take the purse. Her pockets did not appear to have been gone through. It all indicated to, that, that it was a hit. She was targeted, plain and simple. It wasn't a random act. As investigators continue to examine the crime scene, they take a closer look at the condition of Becky's body. She was dressed up to go out for the night. Very clean, not dirty, any way, shape, or form. Her clothes weren't torn off of her, where, you know, maybe a physical altercation had occurred. The bullet hole that was on her left temple area, the blood from that flowed across her forehead and down the other side, which she would have had to have been face down for the blood to go in that route. So it appeared that whoever had done this had rolled over possibly to make sure she was dead. So I believe this was definitely to kill her with that intention. It is truly a rural area. Very few people live out there. Stranger violence around here is very, very rare. We felt like it was going to be somebody that she had some type of relationship with. And that's what it appeared that she had gotten out and walked around back to, to have a conversation with someone. While crime scene investigators finish processing the scene, detectives go to the address listed on Becky's driver's license, a home just minutes away. We went to the door and knocked on the door, which was answered by Deborah Dillard. The officers did not tell her at that time what had happened to Becky because they weren't sure who had done this, but they spoke to her and asked her questions about where Becky may have been going. Was Becky upset about anything? Was somebody following her? Did she have uh, an argument with anybody? According to Deborah, Becky and her husband, Deborah's son, Justin Dillard, had spent the last hour bickering about a party they'd been planning to attend that evening. Becky was coming to the party, and Justin was supposed to be coming with her. Uh, it's our understanding that Justin was having a little trouble getting ready, and Becky was getting frustrated. There was conversation back and forth about whether he was going to go or not go, and then when she decided it was time to go, he wasn't ready and that, that she had left. Deborah tells detectives that Justin left for the party a few minutes later. He got Deborah Dillard to drive him to the party. There was two routes from there that they could get to town. And if they had traveled the route where Becky Dillard was going across, they would have driven right by the sea. But they took a different route. Deborah says she dropped Justin off 30 minutes down the road at Becky's father's house. Detectives immediately head to the party to question Becky's friends and family. I think Deborah Dillard had called and let them know that we were coming. And Justin Dillard and several others were all outside when we arrived. I just knew something was going on and I wanted to know where she was. Is she in trouble? Justin's reaction strikes detectives as strange. He seemed to be assuming the worst and it didn't feel normal. He was grieving before he knew what he should be grieving about. Detectives have a deputy drive Justin down to the station for a statement. And I'm like, am I being arrested? And they say, no, you just need to go with us. And so I'm like, okay, something's up. While Justin is taken to the station, detectives turn to Becky's family members. They say Justin had been acting strangely since the moment he arrived at the party. He had showed up and was like asking where she was and Becky was nowhere to be found. He had freaked out. Justin got out. Where's Becky? Where's Becky? Why isn't she here? Where's she at? Oh no, she's probably in a ditch somewhere hurt. At the time, Becky's friends and family weren't too worried. We all knew Becky was always fashionably late to any family get-togethers and stuff like that. That is how Becky is. Justin was asking, you know, that they looked in the ditches for her and things of that sort, like, like he knew something was wrong. Which, of course, he, he would assume something is wrong when she's not there at the party and she's supposed to be there. They thought, okay, dude, you're being too dramatic. You're being, a, what do we used to call him, drama queen? However, considering that they just found Becky dead on the side of the highway, detectives can't write Justin's comment off as mere drama. We ask if everybody there would be willing to come to the sheriff's department for us to be able to sit down and interview them and talk to them as far as any information they had relevant to the investigation. All the way in, we're talking, man. Why don't they just have us go to the hospital? You know, why are they having us go to the police department? You know, we'd rather go to the hospital and see Becky if she's that bad and that hurt. It's only once everyone's at the station that detectives break the tragic news. Becky is dead, and it appears to be a murder. We were in a haze, disbelief. We were numb. I'm kind of in a zombie mode, as you say. I cry a little bit, but 
I don't want to. I want to be strong. As the realization sinks in, detectives start interviewing the grieving family members. Everything was pointing that it was going to be someone who knows Becky Dillard as being our suspect. One of the main things we try to look for is motive. So it's very important for us to see what the last few hours of Becky's life were. If she had angered anybody, if she had any enemies, if there was anybody that uh, might be making threats towards her. They ask us who we think would do that. And we say, Justin. My suspicion was on Justin. I didn't really suspect anybody else, but I suspected him. Number one suspect. Becky's family tells the investigators that Becky and Justin started having problems in their marriage soon after the birth of the couple's son. The relationship started to break down. I believe that he wasn't ready to be a father. Becky had, I guess I dealt with it already. Hey, I'm a mother and I'm going to do the best I can, put my best foot forward. I think things snapped in him that he wasn't ready for. And then that is when his drinking came. Becky seemed to be on her way. Justin, on the other hand, was calling in to work. Was it showing up to work? The family says that Justin's lack of motivation soon led to problems with Becky. From what I understood, Justin had not worked in over a year, and that was creating financial hardships, a variety of things like that, where she is the one taking care of the family, and pretty much she was the glue holding everything together. Deborah Dillard would take care of him while Becky was working. Becky was upset. You know, it shouldn't be a Nana's job to be a father figure to their grandbaby. It was his job, his responsibility. According to the family, as their household grew with the birth of their second child, so did Becky's resentment towards Justin. As it progressed, when Becky had cricket, things have gotten worse. Finally, by the summer of 2009, the family says Becky'd had enough. She told me once before she was murdered that she was going to leave Justin. She had the guts to walk away from things that weren't good for her. Becky told me many times that she wanted to move out, but she did not tell Justin or Deborah about it because she didn't want them to know because she was secretly saving money, stashing it so that she could move out. She was saving every tip up to a side, hiding it in a sock drawer. She was only saving it so she can get away, get a place of her own. Becky's family tells detectives that she had recently shared some upsetting news involving her secret stash of money. Becky couldn't find it. No one knew other than me and mom what Becky was saving this for. She didn't know where it went. That kind of scared her a little bit and made her sad because now she had to redo it all over again and hide it in a different spot. With or without the money, Becky never got the chance to leave Justin. But does that mean her husband is behind her murder? Coming up, detectives interview Justin. He was crying, but there was no tears coming out of his eyes. And a key witness comes forward. There's two cars that was parked on the side of the road. state troopers found Becky Dillard dead on the side of a Missouri highway. Detectives sit down with her husband, Justin Dillard. We were ready to talk to him. We kind of talked to everybody else first, kind of worked our way through before we talked to him because you want to know as much as possible before you talk to the person that may be involved. We did tell him directly that, that Becky was deceased and that her death did not appear to be an accident, but we could not give him any details due to the investigation. He was just extremely emotional and upset and immediately agreed to cooperate in any way possible. I couldn't deal with it. You cannot explain that feeling ever. I could throw up now thinking about it. My first question was, was she raped? Was she robbed? The only thing I could think of is a random person. He painted her as a very likable person, that there was no enemies out there. There was nobody that he could point to that he thought would do this to her. The population of my town is 300 people. I know every one of them. I couldn't think of anybody that would ever hurt Becky ever. No one. I couldn't think of anybody that would hurt any of us. When detectives ask about his relationship with Becky, Justin's version of their life together is very different from what Becky's family told them. 
Becky wasn't leaving. I was her best friend. I would have known if she was going to leave. I knew everything she did. She knew everything I did. We didn't keep things from each other, and she wasn't going anywhere. She wasn't taking the kids. However, no matter how much Justin denies having anything to do with the murder, detectives are less than convinced. He was crying, but there was no tears coming out of his eyes, and we were strongly wondering if he was involved. But we don't have enough to incarcerate Justin, and we had to let him go. The following morning, detectives returned to Deborah's house, hoping to find clues that might shed more light on Becky's murder. The next stage was to do more follow-up at the house, to go back to where she had come from, the last place that we could place her, you know, prior to her being found dead out there on the road. Detectives don't have a warrant, but now knowing her daughter-in-law has been murdered, Deborah readily cooperates. So, with her permission, we did the consent search there. In addition to the search, detectives conduct a brief interview with Deborah's boyfriend, Billy Estep. My mother had just gone through a divorce, and we knew him through church, and he was more or less our maintenance man. He was kind of a jack of all trades, and I think my mom gave him a job, and so they became friends. I remember her, my mother saying, I'm too old to have a boyfriend, but Billy and my mom did have some sort of relationship. They'd been together for a while, um, but I didn't know how long they'd been together. They were very close from what we could tell. There's little he can tell investigators about the night of the murder. He had told us that he had been drinking and that wasn't feeling well and taking some NyQuil and it kicked in and he just went to sleep. Billy says he doesn't remember Becky leaving or Deborah driving Justin to the party. But he does say that Deborah and Justin must have taken his truck. Deborah and Becky shared a vehicle. Billy had the only vehicle that was there that was running that we know of. So if it's somebody left the residence, it would have had to have been his vehicle. Once detectives learn about Billy's truck, they ask if they can conduct a search, and he leads them outside to where it's parked. Billy Eastep drove a dark-colored pickup truck with a white door on it. When detectives open that white door, they make an alarming discovery. Inside his vehicle, there were some smudges that we thought were possibly dry blood. Detectives collect samples of the suspected blood. Basically hoping that we might get hit on some type of DNA or something. Detectives also ask Billy to come down to the station for a formal statement, but the interview doesn't add much to what he already told them. His story was that he had taken uh, some cough syrup and just immediately knocked him out. They found that hard to believe to begin with, that uh, over-the-counter cough syrup was going to react that quickly. It's just a really strange story. But then he later talks a little bit about the arguments that Justin and Becky are having. He just wasn't completely consistent. And he was trying to really eliminate himself from things as, you know, just separating himself. So it kind of makes you wonder. Which we believe made him uh, more of an interest that he knew what had happened. If he wasn't there, at least he knew what was going on. Even though detectives suspect Billy may know more than he's letting on, they have no reason to hold him. There was no evidence that Becky and Billy had any bad feelings towards each other. It seemed like they just existed in the house together. It was a voluntary interview, and he was allowed to leave at the end of the evening. A few days later, detectives are disappointed again when preliminary testing of the samples from Billy's truck reveal that the stains were blood, but not human. It had us perplexed on, uh, on who it could have been, or actually on a motive on, on uh, why anybody would have done this. We're still hoping and looking and trying to find something that gives us some concrete evidence. While the investigation appears to be at an impasse, news of Becky's death continues to spread through the community. We don't have a lot of murders in Howe County, and so when something like this happens, it would be on the radio, it would be on Springfield News, it would be on the newspaper. Uh, I'm sure it was all over social media, so everybody knew about it. We had a flood of uh, phones. We, we just unplugged the phone. We, we just want to be left alone. It was, it was hard to deal with. Uh, it really was. Then, on November 19th, six days after the murder of Becky Dillard, the Missouri Highway Patrol receives a call that could break the investigation wide open. A man named Tyler Bean called in and basically said, hey, on that day I was on that road. Tyler Bean and his girlfriend had been at Walmart shopping that evening, left Walmart, went and gassed up his truck, and then drove home. So we have him and his girlfriend both seeing our victim parked out there on the road. 
However, as Tyler explains to detectives, Becky's car isn't the only one they saw on the side of the road that night. There's two cars, uh, SUV and uh, I think a Chevy pickup is parked on the side of the road. And both of their headlights were on and everything just like that's normal, like somebody stopped somebody, talked to somebody, just pulled right up behind them. They said there was somebody in the Ford Explorer, which was Becky Dillard's vehicle, sitting in the vehicle, and that this other pickup, they couldn't say for sure, they couldn't identify the driver. No way you tell hair anything. Any, uh, any facial hair that was... I couldn't tell okay. you anything about it. I couldn't even tell you positive if it was a guy. But there is one thing about the truck that Tyler can remember. It was a dark-colored Chevy pickup. It had a light-colored mismatched body part on the driver's side of it. And that matched Billy Eastup's vehicle to a T. Coming up, a polygraph test unearths a huge breakthrough in the case. I walked around the desk. I said, you knew how you were going to do on this test. And accusations boil to the surface. She said he was wearing clothes that looked like they had blood on them. On November 19th, 2009, Missouri Highway Patrol detectives investigating the murder of 24-year-old Becky Dillard appear to be on the verge of a breakthrough. An eyewitness has just placed Billy Estep's pickup truck at the scene of the crime. There was a multicolored dark vehicle with a white driver's door. Just stood out like a sore thumb. On November 20th, detectives contact the woman who'd supposedly driven that truck on the evening of the murder. Becky's mother-in-law, Deborah Dillard. She agrees to come in for a polygraph. That's basically an investigative tool to determine whether or not a person, when they're being questioned, are being truthful. She was very relaxed. Seemed like she uh, felt like she was in charge of what was going on. Deborah seems just as confident when the test is over. She kind of clapped her hands and seemed like she was excited about it. I walked around the desk. I said, you knew how you were going to do on this test even before I did, and I'm sure it comes to no surprise to you that you didn't pass the test. It was obvious to us that she was keeping things from the investigators. She was totally deflated at that point. She was a loss for words, and I could tell it had really set her back. And at that point, I explained to, to Deborah that it would be in her best interest to explain what took place. Put on the spot by detectives, Deborah suddenly caves. Did it help me to kill her? She cracked and, and gave up that Billy was the one. And they actually even recorded a little bit of her saying that. She basically said, the thing that I was keeping from you is that Billy actually left the house that night, that she was still there. And then when he came back, he was wearing clothes that looked like they had blood on them. And that he immediately jumped into the shower, took a shower, and, she, and that she said they really sent up red flags for her. According to Deborah, when she confronted Billy about her suspicions, he didn't deny it. He did a shot in the back of the head. Deborah kind of alluded to the fact that uh, if Billy had done this, that uh, he'd probably done it to help her maintain their way of life with the grandchildren. She was afraid that Becky was going to take away the grandchildren and move away from the, the residence. Before detectives wrap up their interview, they ask her one final question. Have you ever said anything around him that he's construed that you want her to No. After Deborah IDs her boyfriend Billy as Becky's killer, detectives bring the 41-year-old handyman in for another round of questioning. Basically, Billy was confronted with the fact that Deborah was now saying that he had killed Becky. He did state that to law enforcement that he was there, but he did not pull the trigger. He would not say who did it. That's one thing that he just refused to answer. He said, I want to talk to an attorney. And they came in and asked me, I said, yes, for an attorney, we're done at which point the questioning stopped immediately. And Billy was arrested, he was charged, but the investigation continued. Deborah Dillard was still a person of interest at that point because we could not find a true motive on why Billy would have done it. Becky never said anything ill-willed about Billy at all. Our gut feelings told us that they had the wrong person. Debbie and I had talked about it, it was like, no, it can't be him. On November 21st, after only 15 hours in jail, Billy decides he's ready to talk to investigators. Well, before you say anything, I'm going to ask you a simple question, Billy. On every sand in your statement this morning, when you said, I don't want to talk to you anymore, I think I need to turn. Are 
claiming that she was the one who murdered her daughter-in-law, Becky Dillard. That was it. That was the nail in the coffin, basically. Once we received those letters, we had a case. However, an arrest isn't the only reason officers rush to reach Deborah. It came across to me when I first read it as a suicide letter. When they walked in to arrest her, she was in bed, and she had the pistol laid beside her, and when they walked in, they told her that uh, they needed her to come to the station, and her hand automatically went to the pistol. Detectives had to draw their weapons on her, and they were afraid that she was either going to harm herself or them. If she was meaning to end her life at that point, they basically talked her out of it and uh, arrested her. When detectives question Deborah, it's clear that suicide isn't the only thing she's having second thoughts about. Are you afraid to send to jail for what no. you've done? No, I'm not No, I'm serious. I haven't done anything. She said that she loved Billy so much that she could not live without him, and that it was her plan to make this false confession, saying that she did it and that Billy didn't do it, and then she was going to kill herself. But then she chickened out. Deborah's sudden reversal is a frustrating moment for detectives. I'm going to have you tell me the absolute truth today. I'm so sick of all the drama and the bull crap. I can flush it all away. No, because I'm going to prevent it. I'm telling you. In yet another twist, Deborah also reverses her original statement fingering Billy for Becky's murder. I really believe that Billy did not kill her. I really believe that. Detectives don't believe any of it. At that point, we pretty much feel like we had the two people involved. She had uh, means, motive, and definitely had opportunity. They had enough probable cause to arrest Deborah Dillard for first degree murder. When I found out that they had finally arrested Deborah for murdering my daughter Becky, I was ecstatic. I was like, it's about effing time. But they still had to prove it in front of a, a jury. When Deborah goes to trial in January of 2011, the prosecution argues that Billy's story and Deborah's written confession are the truth, that she was the shooter. The autopsy in this case revealed uh, the trajectory of the, of the bullets and was basically almost straight head on. Billy Estep was roughly about 6'3", 6'4", and Becky was almost uh, roughly five foot tall. So if Billy would have shot Becky, it would have been at a downward angle. When it's the defense's turn, Deborah takes the stand and once again claims that her confession was false. Deborah Dillard did testify that she missed Billy and she really loved him and she wanted to take the heat off of him. She was trying to end up with the jury to believe that she didn't have anything to do it, but she failed. And they said, how do you find her? Guilty. Murder in the first degree in Missouri means life without parole. There is no other sentence, and that's what she received. The only time that woman ever cried was when she was sentenced a guilty. No remorse whatsoever for the murder, except she got caught. Deborah's son, Justin Dillard, still believes his mother is innocent. She wrote a letter trying to see what she could do to get Billy out. I feel like my mother was trying to save us all by throwing herself under the bus. I lost my best friend. My children lost their mother. I lost my mother. I lost everything. For Becky's family, the police, and prosecutors, the most fitting punishment is that while she was willing to do the unthinkable to get custody of her grandchildren, Deborah will never see them again. Deborah was uh, what I would refer to as a narcissist. Every, it was all about her. Everything revolved around uh, her needs and what she wanted. What she wanted was to have Kobe only to herself at Cricket, and she's not the mom. My sister is, and she hated it. So she made it to where it was only her. Becky would never have taken the kids away from Deborah. She knew that the kids needed to know their grandma, but grandma, Deborah was too greedy and she wanted all their love. information on snapped go to oxygen.com Just after noon on a warm 
warm summer day, 911 dispatchers log an unusual call. 911, where is your emergency? Um, uh, North Cornell Heights Drive. What's the problem, ma'am? Um, either my mom drove herself or somebody came and murdered her. So what makes you think that she's dead? Well, because she was laying in a puddle of blood in my room. Okay, how old are you, ma'am? 17. Okay, and what's your name? Uh, Stephanie. The community of Georgetown, Kentucky reels after the 2003 arrest of David Dressman and Tim Crabtree for the murder of Diane Snellen. The case is presented by Tom Bell to the Scott County Grand Jury. That results in indictments of both Dressman and Crabtree. Investigators also believe that Diane's daughter, Stephanie, was in on the killing. But her arrest is delayed. Stephanie's arrest was a little trickier because of the fact that she was a juvenile when the crime occurred. There was a lag time because it had to work its way through, uh, through juvenile court first and then would have to be presented to grand jury. With Stephanie's arrest looming, police continue to build their case by interviewing friends and family. That's when an additional motive emerges. Stephanie told several people that if her mom was gone, she was going to have a lot of money. She told people that her mom had a big life insurance policy. It was right around $500,000. She had an older brother, so she would have gotten half. On February 12th, 2004, officers finally arrest Stephanie. Even though she was an adult at the time, she was still charged as a juvenile because Stephanie was 17 at the time of the murder. She was indicted for conspiracy to murder. One month before his trial, Tim Crabtree takes a plea. The best way to get the evidence in was to a lower degree of homicide. He pled guilty to a six-year sentence. And once he pled and was sentenced, he no longer had a privilege against self-incrimination, and he had to come testify. In May 2005, Stephanie's trial begins. She pleads not guilty to complicity to commit murder. Complicity carries the same penalty as the principal crime. The charge is based on the fact that all of the participants are planning the same outcome. Killing her mom accomplished several goals for her. Number one, she believed she could call her own shots, which means she could be with Dave. Number two, she believed that she would stand to inherit one half of everything that her mom would leave. The prosecution tells the jury what police believe happened the night of June 5th, 2002. After Stephanie hangs up in this angry conversation with her mother, she has been denied what she believes that she deserves, her freedom. Diane would not give her blessing for David and Stephanie to live together. She snapped. She and David at some point pick up Crabtree and they're going to go confront Diane. Stephanie drove the three of them to her mother's house. Crabtree's outside, keeping watch, while Stephanie goes in the house. Stephanie storms upstairs into her room. Diane follows. Once Diane gets upstairs and Stephanie and her get into an argument, David comes in from behind, and now they've got Diane trapped inside Stephanie's room. The fight ensues. The knife comes out. Prosecutors believe that David plunged the knife into Diane while Stephanie held her and urged him on. I think David was going to go along with anything that Stephanie wanted him to do. I think Stephanie was the leader, David was the follower. Once it was over, they staged the scene to look like a sexual assault and wash Diane's blood off themselves. One of them takes a shower. One of them cleans up in the kitchen sink. They dumped the knife in Elkhorn Creek and dropped off Crabtree on their way back to Gales. And next thing you know, Stephanie's taking Gale and David back to the house. And that was the theory that we had come up with based on everything that we knew. Under oath, 
Tim Crabtree throws the prosecution for a loop. We were going to rely on getting evidence in based on cross-examining uh, the third co-defendant, uh, Tim Crabtree, but he did not cooperate with us at all. I did not know really what to expect in terms of, of how a jury was going to react to this. We had what I thought was a, a superb case of circumstantial evidence. Stephanie's defense argues that investigators had no real physical evidence proving her or David's involvement. My theory has always been that there is an unknown man who murdered Diane Snelling and got by with it. In an unusual move for a murder trial, Stephanie takes the stand in her own defense. The reason we decided that Stephanie should testify is in part to explain how she felt about her mother, what the relationship was, how she had dealt with grief throughout the process. Stephanie's tearful testimony seemed to have an effect on people in the courtroom. It takes the jury more than eight hours to reach a decision. On May 27, 2005, they find Stephanie Olson guilty. She was shocked. She turned to one of the attorneys, started to cry. Stephanie is sentenced to 25 years in prison. It was a sense of relief. It was three years of my career. I was glad that the jury saw it the way we saw it. I was glad to get the closure for Diane and her family. A year later, David Dressman goes to trial for complicity to murder and burglary in the first degree. On June 15, 2006, David is found guilty. He's sentenced to 20 years for complicity and 10 years for burglary. The two sentences bring mixed emotions. I think that Miss Snellen deserves more justice than that. I don't think she should get out. I don't think any of them should. To take a life like that, that's... It's not enough time for him. But with closure comes some comfort for Diane Snellen's family and friends. Anyone that's ever said anything about Diane has had nothing but good things to say about her. She was honest, forthcoming, optimistic, and the life of the party. She was a good person. I'm sure everybody will remember that smile. I know I always will. information on snap go to oxygen.com terrific it was total shock to learn that your sister had been murdered and your niece was missing there was just so many what is she could be the next victim time was of the essence to find her but who would have been driven to cause such a horrifying and violent scene? He still wanted to be dating her. That, I believe, was the cause of the animosity. He was jealous, made no bones about it. He wanted to fight. Officer Wilson let us know that Tracy was not in school. In fact, they are informed that Tracy hasn't been at school for days. I think I was getting a little more anxious by then. Officer Wilson said he would drive to Sanders house and check and make sure everything was okay. And my husband and I could follow. On the way to Sandra's house, Pat, Bill and Officer Wilson get a key from Pat and Sandra's father. The moment we walked in the door, we knew something was bad because of the odor. The officer just spun around and said, everybody out. He immediately called in on his radio that he needed assistance at the residence without putting too much over the air. Officer Wilson had, in his tone of his voice, I can tell that something was wrong when, when I got the call. Inside the house, police discover the decaying body of a middle-aged woman. Her head covered by a blanket. 
the strong odor decomposition told me that the unidentified body at that time had been laying there for a few days. All I knew at the time was it had to be her. It had to be my sister. Sandra K. Werther began life in the post-war American heartland. I was born on August 18th, 1946, and Sandy was born on May 26th, 1949. I'm the oldest sister. Sandra was the youngest, and Edie is the middle sister. We were raised in Chase, Kansas, a little town, and it was a wonderful childhood. Many kids played outside. You know, we could walk to school. We could walk home without any threat. Soon after high school, Sandra sought to start a family. But after two failed marriages, she found herself raising her son, Chad, on her own. In 1976, the single mom took a job at the Eaton Corporation, a factory that produced pistons and gear pumps. She was a very good worker. They enjoyed her. And that is where she met her next husband, Jerry Miles. Jerry was very outgoing, and, and that's why Sandra was so attracted to him. And Sandy and Jerry, after they met, they got married pretty quickly. Sandy seemed very happy. Jerry legally adopted Chad, and soon the couple were expecting a baby of their own. In September of 1980, they welcomed a daughter, Tracy Lynn Miles. Sandy she was very excited to have a little girl. Tracy's so sweet. She was beautiful, had a big smile. Every time that she would walk into the room, you're like, oh, Tracy's here. Sandra and Jerry's marriage seemed perfect. Jerry was a great dad. He always took Tracy and Chad to the lake, spent quality time with them. He loved them more than anything. Sandra always liked to have a family dinner where she'd cook everything and have the family all together. But their happy home was eventually shattered by addiction. Sandra was married to Jerry seven years. He was an alcoholic, and that just ruined the marriage. I always saw him as a good husband and a good dad. When they got divorced, I was surprised. After Sandy's divorce from Jerry, it was pretty difficult for her as a single mother to take care of two kids and go to a job daily, and she handled it pretty well. She still gave plenty of time and attention to her children. She was a loving mother. Hardship brought mother and daughter closer together. Tracy and Sandy were so close that Tracy would walk up and sit on her mother's lap or hugging on her. When kids get to be teenagers, sometimes they pull away a little bit, but they were, they were very close. Tracy, she didn't like it that her mother had to work so many hours, but she once told me, my mother's doing it for me. By the spring of 1997, 16-year-old Tracy started dating, and she and Sandra began to butt heads. Sandy clearly did not like Tracy's boyfriends, and that was a bone of contention. But as is typical for teenage romance, Tracy's relationships were fickle. After calling a truce with Tracy, Sandra surprised her daughter with a gift, a black Ford Mustang. I think all of our family was into cars at that time, so having a Mustang was a really big deal. Tracy was always the first student out into that parking lot. And it's like, is she like by the door already or what? <laughs> and she'd get in her car and she would just take off. <laughs> the future was looking bright for Sandra Miles and her children. To top it off, in March of 1998, Sandra's 22-year-old son Chad and his girlfriend Mindy shared some wonderful news. Mindy was pregnant, and Sandy was so excited that she was going to have a grandchild. Sadly, Sandra wouldn't live to become a proud grandparent. On March 30th, 1998, Hutchinson homicide detectives respond to find Sandra's partially decomposed body on the floor of her home. When I opened up the door, I could smell foul odor, which known to me as a decaying body. Detectives carefully remove the blanket covering her head and make a disturbing discovery. She was lying face down with a stitching cord twisted around her neck, and her head had been struck several times with some kind of an unknown object. 
it was clear at that point it was not a natural death. It was immediately thought to be a homicide. Police now fear that Sandra's daughter, who hasn't been seen at school in days, is also a victim. We were looking for a Tracy to see if she possibly was deceased in the house. Tracy could have very well been a murder victim herself. An exhaustive search of the home confirms only one body. Now, investigators have two mysteries, a murdered mother and her missing daughter. We had to try and find Tracy. She might be seriously harmed or injured or killed somewhere, and you had to do everything in your power to investigate that. Coming up, a police pursuit sends the case in a surprising new direction. There was a red vehicle that backed out of the driveway and left at a high rate of speed. Sergeant Hoover gave chase to the vehicle. I was absolutely shocked. Who could hurt this sweet woman? in Hutchinson, Kansas, launch a two-pronged investigation into the brutal killing of 48-year-old mother, Sandra Miles, and the disappearance of Sandra's 17-year-old daughter, Tracy. It was total shock to learn over the phone that your sister had been murdered and possibly your niece was missing. The rest is well-kept, very quiet neighborhood, and when this tragedy happened, it really shocked the neighborhood. A preliminary exam of the body reveals just how violent Sandra's last moments must have been. Well, the cord around the neck, it appeared to be some sort of electrical cord that went to an appliance. My guess was she was laying on the floor face down and the cord was wrapped around her neck and she was strangled from behind. I saw blood stains from the blunt force trauma to her head. It was a pretty severe beating. The first thought was that it was a uh, aggravated burglary and Sandra just happened to be there at the wrong time. A closer examination of the scene suggests this was no robbery. From appearance there was no force entry because the door was locked prior to me being called there. Based on the sheer brutality of Sandra's injuries, detectives believe the crime was personal. When you see that, there's been severe trauma to the upper body, and it's been covered. They want to disassociate themselves from that person. That's usually a telltale sign that the victim knew the attacker and vice versa. Police officers have been sent out to question family members. They're trying to locate all the friends. So you're trying to find any possible person who could be involved with the situation looking at ex-husbands, friends, uh, anyone that Sandra has had problems with. Hutchinson police meet with Sandra's family first. The whole family was very concerned about Tracy and concerned that she had been abducted and was, you know, possibly a victim also. Sandra's sister tells police that she last saw Sandra alive and well five days before, around the same time Tracy was last seen in school. The body had been found on the 30th, and with the decomposition and the rigor mortis, then it's easy to go back. It couldn't have happened before the 25th, but it had to happen pretty quick to that date. And while the house doesn't appear to have been robbed, there's one glaring absence. We did find out there's a black Mustang that Tracy drives, and it's missing. Sandra Miles had given it to her daughter, Family members say that Sandra didn't have enemies. Sandy was just an, a good person and did well with making friends. She was very friendly to people. There's no sign of a murder weapon, no suggestion of motive, and barely a handful of clues. At that point, you look at any family member, you look at ex-husbands, boyfriends. Uh, since we can't find Tracy, looking at her friends, so we're trying to track down anyone who had any contact with either of the Miles. In a small town the size of Hutchinson, word spreads quick. I was absolutely shocked. It's like, who could hurt this sweet woman? 
once we put the crime tape up, there was a large gathering around the area. as what I call looky loos people just stand and watch and see what's going on. Among those crowding the crime scene tape is Marion Mock, a neighbor from across the street. He tells police that he last saw Tracy five days ago on March 25th with two teenage friends. Marion Mock had seen Tracy get in a pickup truck with one of the boys, so that obviously is something that had to be checked out immediately. The friend's name is Mark Long Jr., and he lives near the Miles residence. Sergeant Hoover went to Mark's residence, wanted to talk to him. Once they got there, there was a red vehicle that backed out of the driveway and left at a high rate of speed. Sergeant Hoover gave chase to the vehicle. Instead of making for the highway, the driver turns a sharp corner, coming to an abrupt stop near the Miles residence. Pursuing police order the driver and his single passenger out of the vehicle. Mark Long Jr. was driving the car, and once he was stopped, they put him in a patrol unit. My first instinct as a police officer, I'm thinking the person operating that car has something to hide. Officers cuff Mark and his friend and immediately transport them to the station for questioning. Inside an interview room, Mark says he was just another worried friend. Mark Long heard something horrific happened at Sandra's house and he was concerned about Sandra and Tracy. The police thought they were trying to run, and it turns out that the boys had heard about what had occurred, and they were upset trying to come down there. Mark denies knowing anything about either the murder or Tracy's whereabouts. Mark's friend has the same story, and police have no choice but to let the teenage boys go. There was nothing to indicate that they were involved in any way. When police talk to friends who are closer to Tracy, they learn of someone who could be involved. Tracy's ex-boyfriend, Jeremy Bell. Sandra did not like him, and she felt that Jeremy was leading Tracy down a bad path in her life. The relationship with, with Jeremy Bell had been tumultuous. Tracy and Jeremy had started dating after she split from her first boyfriend, Paul Nelson. It was discovered that Tracy had just recently broke up with Jeremy Bell and went back to seeing Paul. We were told Jeremy was very, very angry over the situation of Tracy dating Paul Nelson. Among the various friends, there were statements made that they had overheard Jeremy say he was going to kill Paul. Police find out that Paul wasn't the only person that Jeremy blamed for the breakup. Jeremy did not like Sandra because Sandra did not want Jeremy at her house around her daughter Tracy because Sandra felt Jeremy was not good for her. Rumors swirled that Jeremy's threats scared Sandra enough to seek a restraining order against him. Some of the people that Jeremy Bell hung around with said he had mentioned that he wanted to hurt or kill Sandra because of Sandra's keeping him away from Tracy. It was something that threw a big red flag up, and he was clearly in the sights of law enforcement. This new information also heightens concerns for Tracy. Time was of the essence to find her. Coming up, was Sandra Miles in the wrong place at the wrong time? He might have went there looking for Tracy and instead found Sandra at home. He strongly felt Tracy was being held against her will. And detectives uncover a secret that might be worth killing for. He was the father. There was no question about that in anybody's mind. are investigating the murder of Sandra Miles, as well as the disappearance of her daughter, Tracy Miles. They now have a potential suspect, Tracy's ex, Jeremy Bell. When detectives pull his file, they find that Jeremy had a violent connection to Tracy's on-again, off-again boyfriend, Paul Nelson. 
both Jeremy Bell and his friend, William LeBunyon, had both been put in jail for violent acts and, and burglary involving Paul Nelson. So clearly that was a big red flag. Jeremy Bell and Billy LeBunyon were arrested for the attack of Paul's roommate. They were put in jail on the 21st, I believe, and had got out just right before the homicide. In fact, the two men were released within 24 hours of Sandra's brutal murder. Detectives scour Sandra's phone records and discover that Jeremy Bell had called the Miles home on the evening of March 25th, the last day Sandra was seen alive. Jeremy became a possible prime suspect. He might have went there looking for Tracy and instead found Sandra at home. Law enforcement really jumped on finding Jeremy Bell and Mr. Lemonian, and they were both interviewed. Billy Lemonian denies any involvement in the crime. What's more, he has an airtight alibi for the period when Sandra was killed. Billy, he actually turned out to be a pretty decent kid after a while. When detectives turn their attention to Jeremy Bell, he freely admits to despising Paul Nelson. Jeremy was jealous. He got apparently upset easily, uh, made no bones about it. He wanted to fight Paul. Jeremy still wanted to be dating her, and she was with Paul. That, I believe, was a, the cause of the animosity. Jeremy insists that he would never harm Tracy. In fact, he says he was worried about her. He certainly just indicated how much he disliked Mr. Nelson and, and tried to indicate Mr. Nelson had got Tracy involved in drugs. Jeremy Bell admits that he called the Miles home on March 25th. Jeremy had called and spoken to Sandy the night before the homicide and had made threats in regards to Paul Nelson and Sandy had hung up on Jeremy. According to Jeremy, it was the last time he ever spoke with Sandra. You have to take anything in that statement with a grain of salt because people are giving their own versions. Jeremy was checked out thoroughly. He gave it where he had been. That was verified. Jeremy was released as a possible suspect. At the same time, the coroner sends over the final autopsy results for Sandra Miles. That indicated the most likely time that the murder would have occurred would have been on the 26th. The autopsy showed there were four severe blows to the head with a blunt object. She actually died of strangulation, but that the blows to the head would have became fatal. Somebody wanted to make sure that she was deceased. It appeared to be overkill on Sandra Miles. That pointed in the direction that it was a personal crime that Sandra might have been targeted. After speaking with Jeremy, police need to track down Tracy's current boyfriend, Paul Nelson. When police contact Paul's parents, they say that their troubled son hasn't been home for over a week. The last time he came by, he brought his friend with him, 18-year-old Jeremy Zwickel. Tracy's best friend was Candace Canal. Her boyfriend was Jeremy Zwickel. Jeremy Zwickel had allowed Paul to stay at his house for several nights for some period of time. There was a friendship there. Investigators reach out to Jeremy Zwickel. Zwickel says that Paul hasn't been there since March 26th. Paul was missing too. Like, okay, wait a minute here. Something's not right. Jeremy Zwickel admits that Sandra Miles had been concerned about Tracy and Paul's relationship. Tracy's mom clearly did not like Tracy dating Paul. She did not think he was a good influence on Tracy. He was told not to come to the house and to stay away from Tracy. Being forbidden to see him only drew Tracy closer to Paul. The two took every opportunity to sneak off together. In the summer of 1997, after weeks of meeting Paul in secret, Tracy received startling news. About a year before the homicide, Tracy had gotten pregnant. Paul Nelson was the father. There was no question about that in anybody's mind. Paul was so thrilled he wanted a permanent reminder. He had a tattoo indicating that he was a daddy. 
His baby's future grandmother had a very different reaction. Sandy had told Tracy, if you don't get an abortion, you're going to have to move out and take care of the baby. Tracy made the decision to go to Wichita and get the abortion. Hall was left with a constant reminder of the loss, a tattoo that said, Daddy P. Clearly there was not a good relationship between Sandy and Paul Nelson. Jeremy Zwickle says that the last time he saw Paul on March 26th, Paul came to the house around 10 a.m. and started packing his clothes. Zwickle says Paul was planning a trip and had the cash to fund the journey. Jeremy Zwickle was aware of the fact that Paul had $2,000, that Paul was leaving in Tracy's Mustang to go to Mexico. As to where the money came from, Paul had an explanation. He said that he had went to his house and secured a VCR and took it to the pawn shop so that he would have travel money. A search of local pawn shops reveals that Paul did swap a VCR for about $50. And that's not all. The VCR matches one that was missing from the Miles residence. According to what I understood of the layout of the house, he would have had to either walk by Sandy's body or step over it to get the VCR. The VCR gives detectives clear evidence tying Paul Nelson to the crime scene. But where did the rest of his $2,000 come from? And did Paul make the 750-mile trip to Mexico alone? Chad, Tracy's brother, was interviewed by the Hutch News, and he strongly felt at that time Tracy was being held against her will. Where was the black Mustang? Was Tracy safe in it, or was she being held against her will in it? There was just so many what is, so we had to find her real quick. Coming up, a nationwide manhunt builds to a shocking climax. The authorities were contacted nationwide to be on lookout. They were acting as if they were dangerous people. We wanted them back in Kansas as quickly as we could get them. of her teenage daughter, Tracy Miles. The police had told us since Tracy was missing, they thought that her boyfriend had abducted her. Police have learned that Paul had over $2,000 cash on him before he left town. When detectives check into Sandra's bank account, they make a stunning discovery. A personal check for $2,000 was cashed from Sandra's account on March 26th the day Sandra died. But, detectives learn, Paul wasn't acting alone. Tracy had gone to a bank with Paul, and they cashed a check. She indicated to the teller that the money was being given to her by her mother to help purchase a car. The teller was interviewed and indicated that Tracy seemed very normal and was showing no distress or anything at that point. Could Tracy be more than an innocent victim? We knew she hadn't been at school, and we were told about her best friend, Candace. So a great effort was made to find Candace as quickly as possible. Investigators locate Candace at her mother's house and ask her to come to the station. Candace confirms that dating Paul drove a sharp wedge between Tracy and her mom. Tracy didn't want to take orders. She wanted to do what she wanted to do. If she didn't get her way, she would throw a tantrum. Tracy and Sandy were having arguments almost continually about Paul and his relationship with Tracy. According to Candace, on the evening of March 25th, 1998, Tracy called Candace to say that she and Sandra had just had their worst argument yet. But it wasn't about Paul or her pregnancy. Sandy had taken away Tracy's keys to the Mustang. The insurance company had contacted Sandy and said, we're going to raise your insurance rates significantly because of the amount of tickets that Tracy's gotten. I think there was quite a bit of animosity brewing in Tracy over that. Everyone who knew Tracy said that was one of the most important things in her life was her Mustang. 
Candace arrived at the Miles' home to pick Tracy up for school early the next morning, Tracy brought her up to her bedroom, where Paul Nelson sat on Tracy's bed. Paul was told not to come to the house, but sometime during the night, Tracy allowed him to come into the house through the window through her bedroom. Tracy had decided it was time to leave or she was going to lose her car. Candace took Tracy to a mutual friend's house. Then, around 8 a.m., she says that Tracy got a phone call from Paul. Paul told Tracy that she could come back to the house. When he told her that, she was happy about that information. Candace says when she pulled into the driveway of Tracy's house to drop off her friend, Paul was waiting by the front door, shirtless. She was under the assumption that Tracy and Paul were going to run off and live together. Candace says she assumed Sandra was at work. But as she left, she noticed something odd. Sandra's car was still in the garage. Tracy was not a kidnapped victim at all. She was a participant in this crime. Tracy and Paul were listed as Candace Most Wanted. Authorities were contacted nationwide to be on the lookout for Tracy and Paul. Friends and family cannot believe it. She was on America's Most Wanted with Paul, and they were acting as if they were dangerous people, and I knew that the Tracy I knew would never be capable of doing anything like this. Sandra was one of her best friends. She loved her mother. I was so concerned about Tracy, but I knew the truth will prevail. It will come out. Just wait to see what happens. On April 1st, 1998, just two days after Sandra's body was found, a U.S. Customs investigator contacts the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. Tracy and Paul came back across the border into El Paso from Mexico, and that was verified through the video from Customs. According to the Customs investigator, Tracy told a U.S. border guard that she and Paul were visiting Texas for spring break and had just driven across the border to Juarez for lunch. They had no reason to stop them at that time. We were verified that they, in fact, had been in Texas. Knowing Paul and Tracy were on the run together doesn't make them any easier to find. Until, on April 8th, 1998, Candace reaches out to investigators again. We received information that Tracy had called Candy. She had the number on the caller ID. She gave that number to Agent Newsom. Detectives trace the number to an address in El Paso, Texas. Moments later, they're on the phone with El Paso police. We wanted them back in Candace as quickly as we could get them. Coming up, investigators have one shot at a confession. I believe that there is a small part of humanity in him. But who is telling the truth? He became enraged, and he just charged her in the door. On the evening of April 8th, 1998, local police knock on an apartment door on the outskirts of El Paso. They are there to apprehend 18-year-old Paul Nelson and 17-year-old Tracy Miles, both suspected of savagely murdering Tracy's mother, Sandra Miles. Tracy had made a phone call back to Hutchison, and it was traced back to El Paso, Texas. And uh, that was the key to their whereabouts. One of them, Tracy or Paul, answered the door and they were immediately arrested without incident. The following day, investigators questioned Paul Nelson in an interview room at the El Paso jail. Paul Nelson, he obviously was very emotional, was frightened, scared. Paul Nelson told me that the last time that he had seen Sandra, she was okay. He said that he had went to his house and secured a VCR and took it to the pawn shop so they would have travel money. I said, okay, Paul, you don't think that we came all the way to El Paso, Texas to talk to you about a VCR? At that time, Paul Nelson started quivering, looked down, said, no. 
I didn't. To me, that was an admission of guilt. Paul confirms that on the night of March 25th, 1998, Tracy snuck him into her bedroom. Tracy was upset with the mother about her car being taken away, and they feared that Sandra would come looking for them if they ran away. According to Paul, that's when Tracy suggested a drastic solution. The planning of this murder happened the night Paul crawled through Tracy's window and they sat there and discussed it. Their process was to kill her so that Sandra wouldn't come looking for Tracy. Paul spent the night in her bedroom. The following morning, Candace came over, picked up Tracy. She was going to go to school. Paul remained hidden in her bedroom with a wooden bear statue he had taken from the living room. Once Sandra thought she was alone in the house, Paul would use it to knock her out. But, Paul says, as the minutes went by, he began to lose his nerve. Paul was having second thoughts about it. I believe that there is a small part of humanity in him where he didn't want to do this. He backed out. Until, Paul says, Sandra flung open the door and surprised him. Sandy had caught him in the bedroom. She became angry. She had first asked him what the heck he was doing there, called him some nasty names, told him to get out of the house. He became enraged, and he picked up the bear, and he just charged her in the door, hit her. He said he struck her several times with the carving and got sick to his stomach. Paul hid the weapon in Sandra's backyard, then called Tracy, who arrived moments later. They noticed that Sandy was still showing signs of life. Paul indicated that he went into the restroom and, in fact, threw up at that point. When he physically got sick, he came back out of the bathroom, and then Sandra was dead, and her upper torso was covered. Paul believed he'd killed Sandra, until Tracy made a shocking confession right before their arrest. Tracy indicated she went into the bedroom, took the cord off of her radio, went back, strangled her mother, put the blanket over her. KBI investigators fly Paul and Tracy back to Kansas to stand trial. En route home, KBI agent Newsom presses Tracy for her side of the story. Tracy was very calm during the interview, certainly admitted that if they jointly decided to commit the homicide, when they got to the point about the strangulation with the core, Tracy kind of laughed or giggled and said, okay, I did it. Tracy was matter of fact about what had occurred. While Paul and Tracy fly back to Kansas, Hutchinson PD search the Miles' backyard. The murder weapon was found hidden underneath a turned-over picnic table. There was blood on the bear statue. Tracy and Paul are charged with first-degree murder. They both face life in prison if found guilty. Paul's defense didn't dispute the killing had taken place, but that it was a spur-of-the-moment crime and he should be found guilty of of voluntary manslaughter and not first-degree murder. Tracy's argument, she changed back that Paul was the main instigator and that Paul had done the strangulation. She played a minor role. Neither Paul nor Tracy have to convince a jury. On February 26, 1999, they each enter no contest guilty pleas in the murder of Sandra Miles. Both attorneys recognize there was no defense. The evidence is so overwhelming that you know you can't win at a jury trial. It was very emotional and hard for our family to see Tracy, to hear everything that they were presenting against her. I asked the judge to give them the harshest penalty possible. On April 22nd, 1999, a judge sentences both teens to life in prison with a minimum of 25 years to serve. Tracy just stood there. She was just in so much shock so traumatized. Paul made an obscene gesture to the judge. Then he was just taken out. Before being shipped off to state prison, Tracy meets with her family one last time in a holding cell in the courthouse. We asked Tracy why, and she just refused to answer us. 
Tracy never took responsibility for her actions and said that she was sorry for what happened to her mother. Friends, family, and law enforcement are left trying to understand how a set of car keys could turn a doting daughter into a killer. It's self-entitlement, and that's what was the death of Sandra Miles, self-entitlement in a vehicle. They're going to be due for parole in several years, and I've thought about that, and I really don't want either one of them to, to get out and be able to walk the street where my sister can't ever do that again. To kill your mother because your car was being taken away, I just can't get my mind around that. You ask yourself, why? Why would a child who loved her mother, why would she be involved in her murder? And you just don't understand it. And you, I don't think we ever will. For more information on Snapped, go to Oxygen.com. With a successful business and a loving family, one California man seemed to have it all. Mom, Dad, you know, the little golden retriever, the white picket fence. I loved going to their house because they were always happy. Until early morning gunshots shatter an American dream. We do have a victim down, multiple gunshot wounds. It tore a hole through all of his family. As the investigation begins, detectives brace themselves for a wild ride. There was a high-speed chase complete with helicopters, television cameras. I've got the bad guys in front of me. I can't let them get away. They watched one of the men hanging out the window, flashing gang signs. There was a lot of doubt, a lot of speculation. This had to be a lot more than just a random murder. She said, I need him taken care of. There was like no emotion, just evil. I know it's you now, I'm coming after you. I don't let killers go. October 2nd, 2002 begins like any other Wednesday morning in Buena Park, California. Buena Park is basically just a sleepy little um, suburban town you know, half hour from Los Angeles. Around 7 a.m., Detective Greg Pelton arrives for his shift at the Buena Park Police Department and is instantly met with commotion. And the call came out at 6.58. I was just walking in the back door of the police department and I see detectives rolling out. I, and I knew at that moment something happened. One of the secretaries said, yeah, they had a shooting down on Pinion Street. I said, okay, so I grabbed my stuff and I... Went out, though. Detective Pelton's partner, Sean Morgan, also responds to the call. It's a shots fired call. In a neighborhood, we don't have those kind of problems. My gut feeling telling me it was going to be a lot more than that. I immediately, literally ran out of the building to my car and started in that direction. Detective Pelton beats his partner to the scene. When I pulled up, I saw a white Ford Expedition. Driver's door was open. And it was parked in the middle of the road. And off to my right, over on the sidewalk, I see a man laying face down. Where the body was discovered was uh, not your typical neighborhood where you would find a dead body next to a car. Those are usually the quietest parts of Orange County. As Detective Pelton takes in the scene, a radio transmission provides more information about the morning's events. A patrol officer has just made contact with an eyewitness to the crime. The witness saw one of our motor officers and let him know what he had just witnessed. Because I just witnessed the shooting. He was out collecting recyclables, cans and stuff. He saw the two vehicles pull up. In broad daylight, a man bolted out of a vehicle and was, you know, running away. And suddenly one of the people inside the car got out and shot him. The witness tells the patrol officer that when the suspects fled the scene, he hopped in his own car and began a pursuit. He's following them. He gave us the direction travel. They went and everything. 
He got a partial play in the vehicle description. The eyewitness report catches the attention of Detective Morgan, who immediately heads in their direction. I figured I was close enough. I might run right into him. We're getting updates that we do have a victim down, multiple gunshot wounds. It is a homicide. Back at the crime scene, Detective Pelton works to ID the deceased. The victim is a man with his right arm partially amputated, appearing to be in his 40s. He didn't have a wallet, so initially they couldn't identify him. I'm walking the crime scene and, and looking up, saying, okay, we got bullet casings in the street, we got bullet holes in, in the fence, I got this vehicle here, is this somehow related to my dead guy? I don't know. Because there was a vehicle left in the middle of the street, they ran that plate and were able to get the owner's information. They were able to speak to his wife, Susan, who was eventually able to identify who he was. The victim is 44-year-old David Montemayor. The biggest identification point we had was her husband lost his right arm, and so he only had one arm, and our victim only had one arm. She identifies so at that point in time, they make the death notification. Born on May 9, 1958, David Montemayor was the second of four children. He grew up in Galveston, Texas, where he and his siblings, Deborah, Darren, and Michael, were raised to value family and hard work. Um, they got along. I mean, they came from a loving household, and they had all the dynamics there for, you know, a good childhood. The family's life in Texas came with some woes as well, especially for David, who suffered a serious injury at a young age. He was helping working on some farm equipment back in the day, and he stuck his hand in some gear and it just yanked it off. In the early 80s, the Montemayor family moved to Southern California to cultivate a new endeavor, interfreight transport. David's father, Pete, instilled an entrepreneurial spirit in his kids by involving them in the family business. They started in um, LA, right off the 91, and there were a small uh, warehouse and a few trucks. And then as they were able to gain more drivers, like one of our operators, they expanded. All of them were involved. Um, so it was really nice because Darren was a driver. Uh, my mom, you know, worked in the office and helped out in the beginning. And then Dave helped out with dispatching and logistics. Deborah, the oldest Montemayor child, was the first to leave the nest. She got married and started a family. My mom married my biological father, um, 83, 84, and then they had me. And then 18 months later, they had my brothers. So she was married for about a year after that, and then they divorced, and then she raised us from then on by herself. We didn't have any contact with my father at all throughout our lives. He was never around. So my grandpa always took that role of a father. She was a single mom. She needed a steady income, and her family provided that stability that she really needed. She worked hard. She was always very much uh, ingrained in like our sports. She was always team mom. We played football. We played baseball. We used to go dirt biking all the time. We travel. We had a great life. Deborah's younger brother, David, was also doing quite well for himself. In 1989, he married a woman named Susan, and together they had three daughters. David made a pretty good salary, and he owned a home in Orange County, which was pretty expensive even in Buena Park. Every time I went to their house, I always remember feeling like that full circumference of happiness. Mom, dad, you know, little golden retriever, the white picket fence. I loved going to their house because they were always happy. David played a large role at the family trucking business, where he helped his father manage operations. My grandpa owned the company outright, and at one point he wanted to step back and give it to his kids. The original intention of the father, as I understood it, was it was going to be a, a co leadership role for Deborah and her brother. And a lot of things in life, what happens is everybody settles into their respective roles. And David settled into a leadership role. Dave ran the show, and that was totally fine with my mom. There was nobody else who could run the show like Dave, except for my grandpa, and he wanted out. Dave did a great job. While David kept operations running smoothly, Deborah took the lead on the administrative side. But after sticking with the family business for five years, Deborah grew tired of barely making ends meet. All she would have to do is ask my grandpa and he would just write her a check. But she never utilized that. Handouts weren't really something that she ever wanted. At the end of the day, she wasn't making anything more than her whatever office rate was, so she left. Without Deborah, the family business suffered, and her father begged her to return. 92, she peaced out. 96, she came back. It was the draw that her father 
needed her, and my mom came back. Once Deborah Perna settled back into the family business, things were going quite well for the Montemayors. Until October 2nd, 2002, when 44-year-old David Montemayor is gunned down in his own neighborhood. He was only killed about a mile from his home. Was it somebody that he knew? Or is it somebody at random? Was it a carjacking? Was it just a street robbery? We don't know at this point. As a team of officers from Buena Park PD sorts through clues left behind at the crime scene, Detective Sean Morgan is on the hunt for a Chevrolet Blazer. It's imperative to catch them. They're a danger to the public because they just killed somebody. Who knows what else they're going to do? I get up on the freeway, and that's when I find them. With the suspected killers in sight, Detective Morgan fires up the siren in his unmarked car. Once they took off at a high rate of speed, now it's a dangerous situation. I've got to let the public know that something's going on so they know to get out of the way, hopefully, and let the bad guys know, I know it's you now. I'm coming after you. Coming up, a high-speed chase puts a community on edge. Helicopters, television cameras, the whole nine yards. As the car was slowing down, the weapons started being tossed out. He's not listening to commands. We think he's armed. Are we going to be able to take them into custody, or are they going to shoot it out? suspects inside the vehicle they started to turn around and talking and looking back in my direction after this commotion in the vehicle they pulled out onto the shoulder and took off at a high rate of speed as detective morgan calls for backup the pursuit becomes breaking news in the local media there was a high speed chase complete with helicopters television cameras the whole nine yards you have the helicopters overhead filming it live and the Commentators are telling you how dangerous this is because so many people are in harm's way. So that really, you know, increased the interest in this chase. I'm requesting assistance because I'm, I'm the only unit in the pursuit of three armed suspects that already now has been confirmed as a homicide. An Anaheim police unit was able to get into the pursuit. He takes over the initial part of the pursuit and eventually his motor blew and he had to pull out of the pursuit. So I'm now the lone vehicle in the pursuit again. They watched one of the men hanging out the window, flashing gang signs. And as the car was slowing down, weapons started being tossed out. They realized that they were dealing with gang members. They also saw the suspects throwing two guns out the window. Did they have more? They didn't know. It really changed the dynamic as that pursuit continued. These guys aren't going away. It's just, are we going to be able to take them into custody or are they going to shoot it out? See how they've already thrown the guns out the window? It's just a matter of time. Little suspects don't get away in pursuits. Suddenly, the suspect vehicle starts to lose steam. The engine starts to smoke, and they are noticeably slowing down. They can't maintain the high speeds they had, so they exit the freeway. Another one of our black and whites catches up. He takes over the primary part of the pursuit as a marked unit. He initiates the hit maneuver, spins the vehicle out of control. It goes in reverse when it, after it spins off to the right side and crashes into a telephone pole and a rock wall. After that happened, one of the people inside the car got out and it appeared he was holding something. He's running to a park where kids are playing at. We know people are there, we can see him. We can't let him get there. He's not listening to commands. We think he's armed. An officer involved shooting takes place. He's eventually hit in the shoulder and goes down. The suspect who had been shot because he had something in his hand, it turned out to be a phone. The injured suspect and seize the phone. Officers also secure the two men still in the vehicle. Once they saw their friend, I think they realized that they had no way out. They stayed and followed the officer's orders. The suspect who was shot, he was taken to the hospital and treated for his injuries. They were all booked at Buena Park Police Department. One of the suspects had the victims, David Montemayor's driver's license in his possession, which kind of solidified the fact that we had the right people. 
As the three suspects are booked, across town, David Montemayor's grieving family members gather at the perimeter of a bustling crime scene. When I first got there, it was early. I mean, there, I mean, they hadn't even covered him up. I was just mortified that, you know, like, that's my uncle. That took a toll on me at that level. Detective Greg Pelton takes the lead at the crime scene. I need to secure my scene, secure witnesses, and, and start the process of processing the scene, getting the corner out there. We got bullet casings in the street. We got bullet holes in, in the fence. I had detectives canvassing the neighborhood, and we had witnesses that were, had been calling it in. Witnesses around the neighborhood provide investigators with details of what occurred earlier that morning. They said that they saw one gentleman. He was being chased by three guys. They were arguing. David Montemayor tried to get away again as he ran. They had all pulled weapons out and started firing at him until he was hit and went down. And then somebody fired a final shot into him. After speaking with several witnesses, detectives know how David was killed, but they still don't know why he became the target of such a ruthless attack. Not only was it just a homicide, but these are gang members. So what's the connection? We're still trying to get information. Family members at the scene informed detectives that David spent his mornings working at his family's business in Compton. Detective Martinez went to the family business and started interviewing employees there, trying to figure out what, if anything, he could find out. He talked to the employees and found out that when they arrived to work, you know, David was usually the first person there, opened the gates, opened up the business. And at this time, they arrived to work and the gates are open, but David's car's gone, he's nowhere to be found. So they're just like, well, what's going on? So Detective Martinez tells him what David's been murdered. Everybody seemed shocked that this had happened. No one knew why somebody would shoot their boss. The most distraught is the victim's sister, Deborah Perna, who works at the company as well. Deborah, the office manager, told police that she had no idea what happened, why it happened. She gave police a list of other employees. As investigators question the list of employees, they begin to pick up on a collective suspicion of Deborah's secretary, 25-year-old Edelmira Corona. A normal question that's going to be asked of anybody in, in the workplace is, have you seen anybody suspicious hanging around? There were a number of people that pointed to some visitors that Elmira had had that were sketchy. People at the business were like, you know, we have a temporary employee here, Edelmira Corona, who, at her desk, she had pictures of savvy-looking gangsters. She had a picture of her fiancé, who's a gang member. The idea that we have this employee who has uh, relationships with uh, members of gangs and the fact that you just arrested three gang members for this killing, it obviously that raises a big red flag and makes that person a definite person of interest. But when detectives speak to Edelmira, she gives them no reason to believe she'd been involved. Myra was somebody who was very temporary. I mean, she was in there for a few months. Maybe she was quiet. She just did her thing. She just helped out with paperwork, minded her own business. She had worked there before, and she had recently come back, but nothing else relevant. Knowing that David made it to work that morning, investigators can begin piecing together a timeline leading up to his murder. David had made it to work, opened the gates, had turned off the alarm system before he had been attacked. Detectives suspect the men ambushed David and demanded he lead them to his house. We find another witness. Happens to be one of David's neighbors. He goes, I saw David drive past his house and he sees another vehicle. We later learned that that was the suspect vehicle. And he goes, I thought that was weird because David's usually a wolf. Despite the fact that his life was in grave danger, David's actions in his final moments suggest he sacrificed himself in order to save his family. They obviously didn't do their homework because coming back to his house, he knew his wife Susan and the kids were still there because they had, she hadn't left to take them to school. He's like, if I take them there, they're going to kill my whole family. So he drove down to the next rest track and pulled in and then he bailed out of the truck and then that's where that confrontation took place. David was a hero. He saved his family. But how did David end up in this position in the first place? Why did they have my uncle? We had no family ties, any gangs. Everybody was decent, hardworking family people that we had known for a number of years. 
Rumors around the business suggest a possible motive. The running theme was at the business, people used to joke about David having $50,000 in a coffee can at his house. And we we're less like, $50,000? And that's what everyone was telling us. Coming up, detectives must consider the possibility that David had a dark side. Being a trucking business, maybe he was moving materials for him, and maybe that was a deal that had gone bad. But are they prepared for what they'll find along the way? He's driving like 100 miles an hour. We're calling the highway patrol trying to get them to stop him. They pull him over with guns drawn because this was dangerous criminal. Deputies with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office charge 32-year-old Sahara Fakir with the murder of 66-year-old Jerry Wheeler, a man she claims she never met. Armed with a bloody footprint and the murder weapon, investigators confront Sahara, hoping for a confession. I know you've been in the house, so what did you go in the house for? I did. This is great. She's totally in denial about um, her being involved in a homicide. The more detectives press her, the more bizarre Sahara's explanations become. What if, what if maybe somebody said they saw you over there? Uh, they probably were working for the Illuminati. Some of the comments that she was making were kind of off the wall. She wasn't talking like you would expect somebody to talk. She had some delusional thinking. In an attempt to discover Sahara's motive for the murder, detectives examine the hundreds of personal journals seized at Sahara's house. Most of her journal entries center around her weight. A lot of her writings were very hard on herself. A lot of it was introspective. You know, I need to be exercising more. I need to be eating better. The examination of Sahara's writings also reveals a recurring theme. It appeared that she had a, a general hatred of law enforcement, but also Douglas County specifically. There was writings that she had that were, I would classify as anti-law enforcement remarks that she had made, and just kind of some animosity toward dealing with our agency. And among Sahara's journals, detectives find a hand-scribbled note with a disturbing message. She had a list of cops that she wanted to see dead. Detectives theorize that Jerry's son, Michael, might have been Sahara's intended victim. Jerry's home is visible from her bedroom window, and Jerry's son would come home and have lunch with his dad in his marked cruiser. As far as we knew, the son could have been the target, or she could have thought that the victim was, in fact, the law enforcement officer. And that was something that we focused on as a potential motive. She had a vendetta against the police department and thought that Michael lived there and she was going in after Michael and Jerry was the one she found. She had every single intention of killing again. This wasn't going to stop. But authorities are still puzzled by what might have triggered Sahara's hatred of law enforcement or her decision to kill a man she suspected to be a police officer. I mean, it was not a self-defense. It was not in reaction or response to anything that he did. So it was unwarranted, unsolicited, whatever her motive was, was completely in her mind and a product of her mind. But something in her mind changed that caused her to take it to the next level. Based on her journal entries, police suspect that Sahara was consumed by shame. Sahara was very religious and she felt shame for committing this deadly sin of gluttony. It completely consumed her mind. As Sahara's shame built, so did her hatred. She would fixate on things, her obsession with her weight, her hate, and her rage. She thought that law enforcement generally was evil. She admitted that she had these violent thoughts and tendencies towards law enforcement. Sahara's ramblings on paper and in interviews leave investigators wondering if she's even fit to stand trial. What do you think is going to happen to you? Allah will get me out because he knows the type of people that's running that crowd. Um, he knows what type of jail this is. This is Satan's jail. I see refuge in Allah from Satan outcast, and 
I am awaiting his wrath. During her plea hearing, Sahara tells the court that God will forgive her for her sins, but he won't be so generous to everyone else. Allah is my lawyer right now. If you do not release me, Allah will have vengeance on you. Like he did in 2009, except that flood. It's only going to get worse. So it was the decision of the prosecution, the defense, and the judge to have her evaluated, and it was determined that she was competent. She made attempts to conceal what she had done, meaning she knew that it was wrong. She washed the knife, she hid it, she knew exactly what she was doing. But Sahara still denies killing Jerry. And from her jail cell, she writes letters to the judge saying she believes she's being punished for gluttony. In her letters, she blames her arrest on binge eating candy after she promised Allah that she would diet and lose weight. She believed that Allah was punishing her for her excess, not for murdering someone. On September 22, 2014, Sahara Fakir goes to trial for murder. With DNA and footprint evidence, the prosecution argues that on the evening of June 18th, Sahara Fakir, overwhelmed by her belief that God was angry with her for her gluttony, decided to kill a police officer. With her knife in hand, Sahara stormed into the home of Jerry Wheeler and attacked the 66-year-old, who she mistakenly believed was a cop. She stepped in his blood, and so that in and of itself probably would have carried the day. And then you have the writings, you have the knife under her bed with the victim's blood. I don't believe she had a personal defense. It was clear to the jury that she did this. On September 29, 2014, Sahara is found guilty of Jerry's murder and is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She was not uh, remorseful. It seemed like she was proud of what she had done. Excess was a part of Sahara's character. She lived this gluttonous lifestyle, and it culminated in the deadliest sin of all, murder. While Sahara sits behind bars, Jerry's family and the Douglasville community are left to deal with the emotional aftermath of her horrific crime. It has rocked us to our cores with everything that we believe in, physically, spiritually, emotionally. You never think that something like this can happen to you, and it can, it can happen to anyone. I know that our family is not the only ones hurting. It, it hurt a lot of people in that community because of how they met Jerry and what Jerry meant to them. He was a good man. He was just a good man. For more information on Snapped, go to Oxygen.com. <laughs> You don't do that unless you're cold-hearted and you're evil. She killed her friend and business partner, Maurice Bird. The more and more investigated, the more and more put the pieces together. Maybe this is our suspect. On December 22nd, 2011, 12 days into the investigation, authorities in Texas place her under arrest. Beverly McComb was extradited back to Guthrie, Oklahoma to stand trial for the murder of Mr. Bird. As detectives work to solidify their case, they uncover that Beverly had secured the gun just prior to the murder. She had bought it in Gainesville, and it was determined that she bought it the day of the murder. Ballistics analysis run on the gun confirm that it is indeed the murder weapon. She did have a 38 caliber pistol, and it was a 38 caliber projectile that was found under him. Preparing for trial, prosecutors begin laying out the events of December 7th. They speculate that Beverly went to Maurice's home that evening alone. She went up to Mr. Bird asking for her money back, $20,000 back, and didn't get the answer she was looking for, became frustrated, uh, left. Instead of accepting Maurice's explanation and heading back to Texas, Beverly circled the block as captured on video. 
that built up in her head of being frustrated that she's out this much money and she just builds up frustration frustration drives around the house getting more upset more upset and then ultimately trying to decide what do i do when you look at that it's it's like you're building up your courage to do what you think you're going to do and especially somebody that's probably in her case not having criminal history maybe she was building her courage Eventually, Beverly returned to Maurice's home, and Maurice let her in once again, and they continued their argument. The paperwork that was on the floor, he probably had it in his hand. You know, maybe the paperwork was trying to show her what he did with the money. Prosecutors believe Beverly's anger boiled over, and they tussled. I believe that looking at the evidence, it appears that it started right where the table and where I saw the chair knocked over area. When she pulled the gun, he turned to flee. He was shot in his back, running into the bedroom. He was trying to get to his gun, um, but I think that she probably chased him in there and shot him again. Beverly shot Maurice three more times, point blank, and watched him die. Then she left and drove home to Texas, where she stashed the gun in her closet as if nothing had happened. I don't think nobody thought at first that she was the one that did you know it was it was kind of a surprise when we figured out it was her was it greed that drove the lonely 65 year old to murder or something more i don't believe that this was motivated by money i believe that it was motivated by beverly wanting to have some relationship or hold on to some relationship was believed that that was a portion of what caused the emotional aspect, um, caused her to drive up, caused her to take care of this. At her arraignment on January 5th, 2012, Beverly looks nothing at all like a cold-blooded killer. Miss McCall made a court appearance in Logan County and pleaded not guilty to the charge of first degree. During her court proceedings in the courtroom, it was weird to me to see a 65-year-old lady in her orange jumpsuit surrounded by other people who commit crimes with the chains around her ankles, chains around her wrists, you would never, ever guess her as a murderer. Then, at another hearing in March 2013, the now 66-year-old Beverly proves that looks can be deceiving. Several months later, she comes back and pleads guilty to second-degree murder. Having had time to think about the evidence against her, Beverly now admits she shot Maurice but claims there was no premeditation. She admitted to doing the murder and explained the reasons why, and, uh, and we, were all, we were all shocked when that happened. Beverly's plea comes with a lighter sentence than a first-degree charge. Beverly took the plea of second-degree murder and was given a sentence of 40 years. 30 years of that is suspended for good behavior. So that means that 10 years and she's out. I know a lot of it had to do with her age. The light sentencing comes as a final blow to Maurice's loved ones. I can't believe that this woman creeped back into my life somehow and killed my cousin's dad. Like, it's unbelievable. No one should get 10 years for murdering someone. No one should get 10 years for taking someone's life. This woman showed up at the funeral, at his funeral, asking for money. She killed somebody. She should, have, she should have went to prison for the rest of her life. This was a bizarre case just because of Miss McComb being a 65-year-old lady. It just shows you that anybody at any time can commit a crime. The devil doesn't always look like the devil. information on SNAPT, go to Oxygen.com.